Namaste and greetings. I, Aswash Mahanta, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evon, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to all of you to IMPRI Web Policy Learning. Today, we are gathered here for the final day of this three-day immersive online certificate training course on India's G20 presidency and the contours of Indian foreign policy. This training program is organized by the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, CIRSS in free. I welcome all of you to this wonderful deliberation and thank you for putting your time, energy, and efforts to truly understand issues surrounding India's G20 presidency and the contours of India's foreign policy. This session will be moderated by our convener, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. These three days, we see an excellent panel of members who will be sharing their knowledge on the above team. The distinguished panel includes, in no particular order, Ambassador Shashan, Captain Alok Bansal, Ms. Nandita Borua, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, Mr. Don McLean Gill, Dr. Parama Sinhapalit, and Professor Annapurna Nautial. Before we start today's session, I would like to announce the housekeeping rules. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a question and answer session after each presentation. Share your questions on the Q&A box and not on the chat box. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee. Ensure that your questions are precise. Refrain from making general comments in the question to save time. Now, without taking much of your time, I would like to invite Dr. Simi Mehta to start off the session with her own opening remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ashwash, and good evening to everyone. Um, it has been a wonderful two day, last two days of our web policy learning on India's G20 presidency and contours of India's foreign policy. Today, it is the third day, and we are equally delighted to have amongst us excellent panel of experts who would be running us through various nuances of India's foreign policy. It is, in fact, a golden year, golden uh, year in our uh, in the history of India's foreign policy as India is the president of the group of 20 most developed and emerging countries in the world. And plus, there is a, a narrative that is going on, which is called the Vishwaguru diplomacy. And I would request in um, uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat's lecture, if he could also throw some light on uh, what could be uh, India's Vishwaguru diplomacy and what, what could be the various pillars of it. So without taking much time, I would uh, request and invite uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat to begin his lecture, before which I would request Ashwash to kindly introduce the Ambassador. Welcome all, good evening. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, without taking time, now I'd like to request our first speaker for today's session, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, who will be speaking on the topic of New India and the New World Order, geopolitics. Ambassador Trigunayat is the former Indian ambassador to Jordan, Libya, and Malta. We are indeed extremely honored to have you with us, sir. Over to you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwas. Thank you, Dr. Semi, and uh, thank you, IMPRI and CRSS, for organizing uh, this interaction, as well as for inviting me to share some of my thoughts uh, on a rather broad subject. But I'll try to do justice uh, within about 20, 25 minutes, followed by Q&A, as is the format. Uh, friends, uh, you all know that uh, since, let's say, about 1980s, uh, we have been see seeing these far-reaching developments in the international world order or international politics. Uh, in fact, it did not even take 75 years for it to come under tremendous stress, as we can see after the Second World War, when the liberal international order 
uh, was created and it virtually sustained until the demise of the Soviet Union in 1990. In between, there have been many uh, such black swan events have happened, uh, be it the uh, problem about the world economies or the wars here and there, various hotspots all around the world. Uh, but we had thought that the state-to-state -state conflict perhaps, as far as the world powers are concerned, uh, would perhaps be minimized. Uh, new challenges were occurring. For example, the terrorism had become such a major issue after 9-11, but it led to not one, but two major wars. That were the biggest mistakes, uh, which were later on proved. And that is that the US invasion of Afghanistan and US's invasion in 2003 of uh, Iraq. The dislodging of these regimes essentially caused the multiplication of extremism and terrorism. So these are the kind of things that happen that continue to challenge uh, the global community and especially India, which continued to suffer way before that from the cross-border terrorism from Pakistan, which uses it as an instrument of its foreign policy. So we have seen this happening then on the, then since 1979-80, as you know, the most important thing has been that the China, which was until then, uh, was virtually left out even of the Cold War syndrome had been integrated by Richard Nixon into the, uh, into the Western fold and benefited from that. And today it has become an economic giant and is ready to uh, displace the United States as the numero uno power. And that's what we are seeing today. Uh, that the, when you, if you were to read various strategy papers that are coming out from the uh, administration consistently, their major challenge has been Russia and the China, or in that order, China and Russia. Now they understand it, but at the same time, China has become far too big within this context. And China is also our largest neighbor and also has this kind of a zero-sum game with India in many ways and tries to contain India within the South Asian paradigm. And that is what the problem, that's where the problem arises from India. So when we are talking of new India, we need to look at these kind of uh, internal dynamic that is prevailing within the region, and we are facing it. Now, in addition, after I uh, mean many years of things going, moving forward, competition was continuing. There were problems between the countries, among the countries, among the groups, between the groups. But there were two black swan events in recent past that have really made us look, sit back and look at what kind of transitional order we are living in, or how we are going to work uh, into the next order, which is likely to emerge. We are, nobody is, knows how, what kind of an order it will be. But let us see, first thing was, of course, the pandemic, which virtually crippled the global economies and continues to have its impact. Its overall impact is still not being assessed fully. And then on the back of it, we have had the, we are continuing to have the impact of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, the Eurasian war, as it is called, in which directly or indirectly, this is a war between the two superpowers. We know that Russia is um, wanted that NATO should stop its eastward expansion, as was agreed to during the de demolition of the Berlin Wall, but that did not happen. And they continued the, the Western ingress towards the uh, Soviet space or the Russian space continued until it was a red line for Russia. That is called uh, the Ukraine or Georgia for that matter, or Belarus. These are the areas which Russia thought were natural to it, and it would be its buffer states in that sense of the term. But once that has started and the Ukraine and the Georgia, the various kind of velvet revolution or whatever you call it happened, we have seen that the Russians have done which was not expected of a superpower in that sense. And the superpower or Russia, which is supposed to have, not have taken the course which has taken, like is invading, which is called as a special operations, uh, into Ukraine. And that is something that has destabilized the whole world. Now, it is not a war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. It is a war between Russia and the West, and more particularly between Russia and the US. Attempts have been made to end the war. 
But at the same time, there are various lobbies in the United States, for example, its military industrial complex, its geopolitical orientation, its threat uh, from the Russia-China combined. All these factors have continued this war at the same pace. It has, of course, created many more new nuances. And those nuances are like we have never seen, for example, the pandemic taught us that there have to be a greater focus on 4H, as I call it, them as 4H. One is the hunger, the second is the habitat, third is the high tech, and the health, the most important. So these are the 4H issues that the world has to deal with in the 21st century as it moves along. But when it comes to this war, what we have seen, it is not an ordinary war. It is a war for one country trying to say that we are trying to protect our sovereignty, our territorial integrity against the Western might. On the other hand, by invading into the territory of another country or arbitrarily trying to change the geographical contours of the whole uh, thing is something that is unacceptable in that sense of the term in today's world. And if you were to believe in the in the uh, on the premises on which the second after the Second World War the global order was configured, but it has happened and we are seeing it that happening. What are the three major things we always hear about? Three Fs as a fertilizer, fuel, and food. These are the three uh, major 3F crises that has happened and that has impacted the whole world. As you know, that uh, very often you must be hearing that the Europeans and the Americans, everybody charges that India is continuing to buy the oil from Russia. And you know, our external affairs minister who had spoken uh, very uh, elaborately and succinctly uh, telling them that, uh, that we are not the ones who are the buying earlier, you were buying so much. But today, of course, Russia has become because there are cheaper oil you have to buy. We are 70, 80% of our oil and gas we require from the world. So therefore, the Middle East oil started going to the Europe again. And therefore, we have to resort to certain alternate supplies. And Russia is our uh, special and privileged uh, strategic partner. So we continue to have our relations with them. At the same time, USA, which is our comprehensive global strategic partner, is there. So now when you are looking at uh, this, what has happened in today is this thing which will decide on the course of the, the new world order or the transitional world order that as it happens today, is that we are looking at the weaponization of the financial instruments. The weaponization of financial instruments, like you remember that when this war started, the Americans put sanctions and froze $380 billion, $90 billion of assets, the Russian assets, foreign currency assets in the uh, United States. They banned the SWIFT, which is the control by the US, um, the, uh, the Russia's participation. Of course, in the long, short term, it has not impacted Russia that much because it has collected enough gold. It knew that the sanctions are going to be the way of the, of the West. Uh, in any in any case, it may be a miscalculation on their part. On the other hand, then what Russia did, Russia started weaponizing the energy, and because it was supplying nearly eighty percent of the energy to the Europeans, and uh, uh, the Americans also in turn were impacted. So the whole world is facing this crisis. But who is facing the most? It is the global South, as we call it, the developing world, which has no. We are not part of this this game, nor are we part of this war. But at the same time, we continue to suffer the most in that. So, but we are, India is a country which is reckoned with today. We, it may not be a superpower. It may not be a major power today. It may be a middle power. It is an aspiring power to be, it's a regional power. But what it is trying to do today is it is trying to create the narrative. It is not wanting to remain as a rule uh, follower, but it wants to become a rule maker in this world. And therefore, by creating the kind of narratives which India does, it does not want to become a, a military superpower in that sense of the term, but it wants to have a strong enough military which can protect its borders, which can protect, uh, provide it the necessary heft to continue to prosper or economically develop in this sense. And that's precisely what Prime Minister Modi's uh, current policy in the recent domain has been. So when we are looking at New India, we say that it has a robust foreign policy and it is a foreign policy that is driven by our own national interests. Now, our national interests are, of course, 
uh, we have to see that our economic development not does not suffer. The critical energy supplies are not disrupted. The technology uh, uh, collaborations continue apace. We should become a part of the global and value supply chains. So this is the kind of things that you can do when you're following a policy, which is very well known. At the same time, at the global level, when you are looking at it, India's policy has been, which you all know, is called Vasudhaev Kutumkam. Now, Vasudhaev Kutumkam is not merely uh, a simply some kind of a statement uh, just to impress the world, but this is virtually in the DNA of India. It has not happened from now. It has been all through. We have been helping the Global South. India stood immediately after the independence, as you know, that within a few years' time, we helped create non-aligned movement fought against the decolonization and worked for the decolonization of various countries in the world and created something called non-alignment movement or the South-South Cooperation Movement. And India provided tremendous assistance and today does it to more than 161 countries. Then you come down to the pandemic. So during the pandemic, what happened? During the pandemic, while the whole world was trying to hoard it, especially the United States, the big countries, because they have the power, they have the wherewithal to manufacture the vaccines, to, to, to control the markets in many ways. And therefore, they were trying to keep it. But on the contrary, India, which is uh, said to be the pharmacy of the world and now the, the vaccine center of the world, started sending initially the supplies to the world, 150 odd countries, provided vaccines to more than 100 countries. While having the second largest and today the largest population in the world, it has shown to the world that we not only try to look after ourselves, vaccinate our own people, but we are there to help the world. And that's precisely what has provided India the kind of Vishnuguru thing that we are looking at. It does not mean that we are Vishnuguru by, uh, by force. We are Vishnuguru by acceptance of the people of India's benign policies, India's benign and more inclusive approach as far as the larger global world is concerned. And that is why today we may not be a superpower, but at the same time, no equation, global equation in the world can operate without India being included into it or India, because why? There are very simple things. Number one, not only that we are a nuclear power, we are a space power, but we are also today uh, the fifth largest economy, which is likely to become the third largest economy in the world. We are the only economy, major economy that has been growing despite the pandemic, has come out of the pandemic rather fast. Of course, it's too early to say because the whole rest of the Western world is going through recession, which might have an impact uh, on us. Then more importantly, during the, uh, the, the thing is that last two months we have crossed, uh, as far as the statistics go, we have become the most populous country. We have the biggest youth dividend in the world and which will last at least until 2050. So we have this window until 2050. And as you know, Prime Minister has mentioned very clearly that not only we are going to be five trillion economy by 2025, but I think by 2027, it might be a uh, big trillion dollar economy. And by the 2047, when we are looking at India, uh, to be the developed country in the world, at that time, our economy could be more than $30 trillion. And the gap between China and India could perhaps be bridged much faster. Today, they are five times our economy. So in, the, in this domain, India is doing very well, ex extremely well, so far, so good. Now, coming to Russia-Ukraine war, this position is often discussed, exactly what India is doing. Now, India's position... Uh, initial days was essentially guided by two things. One was that we had 20,000 odd students who were there and Indians who were there in Ukraine. So we had to take them out from the uh, war zone for which you needed the help of both the Russians as well as the Ukrainians because the Russians were there inside as well. At the same time, India continued to provide humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. Several uh, flight loads plane loads of uh, relief materials and others went to Ukraine. India tried that at the United Nations Security Council, we were at that time in the, uh, 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 in, the in the presidency of the UN Security Council, when India clearly mentioned that dialogue and diplomacy are the only way peace is needed very much. They were, the both parties had given way very quickly to the rule route of diplomacy. They must respect UN Charter. UN Charter means sovereignty and territorial integrity of all nations. 
So when we are talking of territorial integrity, very, very often, the conveniently, our Western friends forget that when we talk of territorial integrity, it was not of Russia. Territorial integrity, when we are talking about, it was that of Ukraine, because Russia was inside Ukraine. So it is not something. Secondly, recently, as Samarkand, Prime Minister Modi has been talking to both Zelensky as well as Putin, and has told President Putin very clearly that the era of war is over. It is extremely important to understand that statement. It is not again a statement. India has again told, now that we are holding the G20 presidency, about which I think all of you are very fully aware, the kind of events that are going around. We recently had the foreign minister's meeting. Before that, we had the finance minister's meeting and the umpteen number of uh, Sherpa level and other talks, 200 odd meetings are going to take place all over India. So India is showcasing it in a way like a country which holds an Olympics do. So we are trying to show our country. At the same time, we are trying to tell the world that India has arrived, that India can create and craft uh, the, the necessary rules which are beneficial to the majority of the world and not only for the G7 countries which want to dictate the kind of rule-based order they think is correct. Now imagine the Americans always talk about rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere. They have not even signed the UNCLOS treaty right? United Nations Law of the Seas. They have not done it. Then they talk about the, the, the war and the crimes and other things, but they are not part of the International Criminal Court. You can imagine, and during the Trump time, they went out of nearly every major treaty. They even wanted to get out of the WHO. The WTO and all kinds of international organizations have been held hostage. So the countries that are supposed to be the guarantors of that kind of a regime are actually destabilizing that whole thing. So this is where the role of the Russians and the Chinese come, and they think that they can assume their role and they can provide an alternates. Now, their alternates definitely are not going to be acceptable to the majority of the world, but at the same time, they are powerful economies, uh, both rich, resource-rich and powerful countries. So they are trying to create this kind of a situation. Now, in this, India has followed a policy of non-alignment, I would not call it non-alignment, I would call it as strategic autonomy. It is a bit different because you are making considered choices. Now, time has come, and as you have seen, those who are following, that in very many countries in West Asia, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, are against the war, number one, and don't want to do anything with either of the two sides. They would rather like to have exercise their choices of foreign policy so that they can develop their countries. And that's precisely what they are looking to do. And when they are trying to do that, in that they need, their, they, many of them don't have the kind of requisite heft that you require to exercise like India has. So therefore, those countries are now, uh, can become a part of a global, again, a network. And I call it as nations for a strategic autonomy. And I personally feel that India after doing this G20 the way it has done, the way we are part of all major groupings in the world, the way we support the United Nations having been a founding, founding member, despite it not undertaking its uh, reforms and hoping that somehow it will conduct the reforms which will then lead to its greater relevance. It has not been able to resolve any major problems, but India wants to maintain these institutions and believes in the multilateral institutions. So India, in that sense of the term, is a unique country which is showing the world that how by dialogue and diplomacy. Now, one more thing is when we say that uh, dialogue and diplomacy are extremely important, you might ask, OK, it is just a statement from India. But no, you know, we have the problem with China. It is a country which has invaded us, Gal Gal Galwan. We had a problem in Tawang. We had a problem in uh, other places. Uh, uh, a, on the border with China on a daily basis, really. And we have our forces from eyeball to eyeball. But what are we doing? We are preferring to talk. We are not letting the disputes become into conflicts. So we are still talking to them at the border. Of course, certain mechanisms have been suspended since 2019. Before that, Prime Minister Modi himself had met the Chinese President Xi Jinping almost 18 times. We are also the members of the BRICS, as you know, uh, then, which is likely to be expanded under the South African presidency. We are members of the RIC, Russia, India, China grouping. We are a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where China and Russia are both. 
These are the three very major organizations in, in which India, apart from the G20, in which India, Russia, and China are partners. On the other hand, we have uh, we are partners in the Quad, as you know, in the Indo-Pacific, because ever since uh, the, the, the world, uh, especially the attention of the Americans and the Western world, has moved towards the Indo-Pacific, and that has happened because the economic pivot has moved towards the South. That is the main reason. And the China's growth story, which is uh, very often could be an inimical story for the global good, uh, is what China, Americans and the Western countries would like to contain. But that is not an easy task. So they are also following very similar policies as we are doing. We are following the policy of competition with cooperation as far as uh, uh, the, the these countries are concerned. At the same time, we are also uh, follow the Chinese are also following the policy of competition with cooperation with the uh, uh, with the uh, Chinese, uh, and I think that in that there is a, of course any flashpoint in Taiwan or in, or East China Sea or South China Sea, those can create a bigger problem in this. But we need to uh, we need to see that we are we have shown to the Chinese also that India is not going to be cowed down as far as its territorial integrity and sovereignty are concerned. And there is enough place for both of us, but at the same time, the Chinese policies, whether it is through BRI, through its uh, string of the pulse strategy, those of you who study international relations would know. Uh, so India came up with its own doctrine, which is called Saga, you know, which is for growth for all in the region. Now, maritime security today's time and age is extremely important. So we have two major threats on our borders. One is China, other is Russia, uh, sorry, uh, the, the Pakistan. But at the same time, we have a very large number of threats also. India, Prime Minister Modi, actually in the beginning itself, and I'm just keeping it the last eight, 10 years, because it is also a continuation of those policies, the more robust and result-oriented approach uh, in the current way, which is India is far more visible on the international stage. So these are the things that are going to, to, to play around. You can go back to 50 years, 70 years and talk about it. But the most important thing is today's India is strong. It is ready to take responsibility. It wants to be the rule maker. And the rules that are equity-based, equity that are justice-based, that are good for all the world, which are, which are taking care of the global goods and global commons for the larger uh, society. Uh, in the world, so that this Vasudhav Kutumkam does not remain a matter of principle or a policy for India alone, but should become a part of the world. Another major challenge is climate change, in which, you know, again, the, the world is divided between the developed world and the developing world, despite all these conference of parties, conferences happening here and there, and various kinds of statements being made and some connections done. But the green growth is absolutely essential because this is the existence of the humanity per se. And in this also, India has taken a major lead. And I would say the major lead is, uh, you can just talk about International Solar Alliance. Since non-alignment movement, and this is the first multilateral initiative which India has really uh, carried forward along with uh, France uh, and is moving forward in that direction in a very big way. Now, we do not know how the uh, the the Chinese and the Russian combined uh, will move, but in my view, how I look at the world is uh, that the Russia Chinese, or especially China as a bigger partner, Russia as a, a smaller partner as it will come out of this war, which might even be a frozen conflict. One does not know. Uh, would probably lead the world into becoming a Cold War 2.0 kind of scenario. Now, if it becomes a Cold War 2.0, it will be a bit very different from what it was. And that is, unless we do not have the nuclear conflagration be between Russia and the West now, we never know what happens tomorrow. Uh, but at the same time, hopefully, uh, there will be uh, uh, some good sense that might prevail. But that is our hope. We do not know the underground situation, how do you eventually play out? Because the conditions are ripe uh, for escalation. Uh, in the region, in the Eurasian war, and that could be devastating for the whole world, uh, let alone uh, the, the the region or Russia or, or Eurasian countries. It'll be the worst. We have seen that disarmament has just been shelved. It's the effort for SDGs 
uh, have developmental goals are no longer on the horizon, no longer on the picture. The world in uh, the this the world, especially the the developing world, suffering the brunt of all these kind of developments and policies, and the multilateral organizations are barely sufficient to stake through uh, the the day to day uh, requirements of the current very complicated and a complex world. So I think that it is a, a situation which is evolving, uh, in which today it is very difficult to say uh, what kind of a world order will be. But we know that India is ready to play a leading role. We are in between the orders or transition order or disorder, whatever you may call it, uh, it is there. But at the same time, no powers will remain alike. America will come out depleted out of this. The West European countries will not be the gainers. Nobody gains in this war, actually. Everybody is a loser. And if there is a flashpoint in the Indo-Pacific between China and the United States, which is also going in high pitch, then we are in for a much larger trouble uh, as far as the world is concerned. But for now, uh, from all counts, India is uh, on the global horizon, as you can see. You know it, there are efforts which are to undermine India in many ways, but I think that our leaders do have that uh, kind of policy where they take judgments on the basis of national interests, uh, or given the complexity of the international uh, uh, domain, uh, which is still rather uncertain. So I leave it there, but at the same time, uh, I would say that the, the whatever happens tomorrow, India will probably be the third pole, which many of my friends may not agree, but India has the time on its side. And uh, next 20, 25 years, we have to continue to Amrit Kal, as it is called, continue to progress and prosper without getting entangled in, into any major conflict. Countries like China, Pakistan may like to drag. Countries like America may wish to see India and China having a conflict <clears throat> so that both the Asian economies go down by 20 years. But that's a hypothesis, but not way of the mark. It is quite possible because that's how the geopolitics plays out. Who knew that until uh, one year ago that there will be a war uh, between Russia and Ukraine or Russia and the West and the kind of war that will take place? No one could predict <clears throat> that the Soviet Union will disintegrate. Nobody knew, I mean, you know, second, after Second World War, Germany, or before that, Germany tried to be a hegemon. But what happened? The British Empire, which used to be there, it got decimated, and the new country like America, which emerged as the sole power in their Cold War, and eventually it became the hyperpower or the unipolar world. That is also unipolar world is no longer applicable. There are millilaterals, as I mentioned earlier, breaks, rake, and all those which are quad. I2U2 and others which are emerging, free trade agreements, comprehensive economic partnership agreements. The world is trying to find ways where you can serve your national interests. And it is in this context that I think that the, we are going to see India moving and India will be a benevolent force for the larger good of the larger world. I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it has been wonderful listening to you. India as a benevolent force. Uh, what a uh, wonderful way to end your lecture. Um, so uh, before, uh, I mean, uh, I give time for all the participants to ask their questions. So in the meantime, when they are uh, mulling over it, I have a, a few uh, questions to you. Uh, yeah. First is about the importance of the United Nations and the whole narrative of India deserving a spot in the permanent uh, membership in the UN Security Council. Um, uh, do you think well, it is really practically possible that there are, the members would be allowing or they would be, you know, because the, the several countries, leaders who come uh, to our country and the bilateral meetings that happen, yes, uh, they say that, yes, India deserves and the, all the promises are there. But but then we don't see it happening. Uh, but then does it really matter at the end of the day? Because we are a global leader and a force to reckon with, uh, even though we are not a permanent member of the UN Security Council. 
So what well, you United, on? I would say that United Nations probably is a necessary evil today. You need a place where countries can meet, where they can talk, they can speak their mind, convey the, the views of the largest number of countries. But the problem of the United Nations has been a lack of reforms. It has refused to live to the expectations or the changing realities of the world. Um, this is not what it was in 1945, a world that was victor and vanquished. Today, there are multiple powers, regional powers that are there, uh, which are contributing greatly to the economic growth, overall growth, and therefore it cannot be dictated. Now, countries like India, especially India in this case, is, has the credentials which very few countries have. Uh, whether it is the respect for the UN Charter or being a part of the United Nations, we have been the founding members of the United Nations. Yeah. We are the largest contributors as far as the peacekeeping, or peacekeeping operations are concerned. And uh, so I think that largest economy, largest population, whatever. It is. So all those credentials are very much there. Now, you the thing is that if UN does not reform, India says very clearly that then it can become irrelevant, then nobody will care about it. You see, there are only P5 countries. Whenever they, these countries or their own surrogates are not involved in any war or conflict, things move smoothly. But when they are, they are directly involved, like in this war, Russia is involved, China is, has its own problems, USA has its own problems. You see, the unilateralism of the superpowers cannot be contained in, in, the, in this Security Council. So when it does not happen, it loses its relevance. The whole world sees it. Now, if 190 and the other 190 countries go and say something else, and these five countries say something else, or even one of them, then it becomes a problem. So that is why it is essential for a country like India to be there. Of course, it has to be a reform. The reform means, let us say, I mean, it should not be that single country can absorb everything. A reform can be that let the majority of the UN Council countries, UN Security Council vote, should be counted. So it can be nine, six, or maybe if an increased one, then there are five more. So maybe there will be hardly a chance when there'll be 10, 10, let us say if it is a 20 member. So it is important for India to be there. Now, in the meantime, what India has done, India has attaching great significance to the, 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 uh, the organizations like G20, which is in a way an alternate because it's, it represents more than 85% or 90% of the global GDP and more than two-thirds of the world population in only these G20 countries. So they essentially are the rule makers. And so that's why India has become uh, more interested in the G20 uh, activities. Uh, and it is also virtually a part of G7 plus one. That is, every time the G7 meeting is held, India is included in that. So you are on the high table, basically. But you want to be on the horseshoe table so that if the United Nations stays, you are there as a rule enforcer, as a rule maker, rather than as a rule follower. So that is, I think, is important. And uh, UN has uh, no doubt uh, its weaknesses, but at the same time, it has its strength also uh, for a very large number of countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, response. Uh, yes. So uh, I would request Ashwini Ghatikar to please ask her question. Good evening, Ashwini. sir. It was pleasure hearing you. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, to what extent do India's domestic issues and challenges impact its ability to act as a benevolent power on the global stage? Well, as you know that the, the, the domestic policy of any country directly impacts its foreign policy because you use the foreign policy essentially for your own development, for your own growth, and have better external environment. So obviously when you're going to do that, so if there are problems in a country, then obviously whatever you are going to do abroad, uh, it will be reflected there. Now, if you have certain weaknesses, in your governance structures, if you have certain problems, they will definitely be called out. Now, uh, for example, like when we are talking about these vaccine metri, you remember uh, this initiative that happened because India believed that these are the global goods 
and they must be available to all the countries. There should not be a vaccine apartheid. So that consistently followed by your policy of this. Now we are looking at peace within peace, outside, trying to develop dialogue and diplomacy. That is the way to deal with it. And that's where I think that it has a great impact, uh, especially on the other countries which are looking to uh, follow you. But so what you say, you must be able to follow. And that's the reason that many countries, uh, unless of course you are a superpower, because these superpowers behave in a very erratic manner. Uh, they go into unilateral ways. They don't care about the domestic public opinion so much. But even the United States does, because they cannot take the body bags. When the body bags are coming, the op public opinion changes, unless you are an authoritarian in regime. So it depends on what kind of a country you are. In the case of a country, India, which is the largest democracy in the world, of course, when it talks, it talks of the, of the high lofty ideals just like that. But it follows them in day-to-day -day practice with regard to uh, several other, uh, you know, the rest of the world uh, in that sense. Like whether you take our um, a policy with regard to our neighbors, neighborhood first policy, you take India's Act East policy, you take the Link West policy or the Act West policy, or you take the, the India's relationships with different countries. Uh, so you find that it is all, of course, aiming towards gaining your own national interest, but at the same time to create conditions for peace and development in the rest of the world also. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Sneha has a question. Sneha, you could unmute yourself. Sneha. Good evening, sir. My question is, can we expect India to be the superpowers in the coming years based on the present scenario that the world is, uh, uh, the world is facing through? Okay. It is very difficult to say, uh, but you know, I um, I read somewhere that there was a, it's all a hypothesis, for example, and then you have to see what superpower means. Superpower means you should be able to dictate the course of your will uh, way beyond your borders or in any geography of the world, wherever you want. Today, that power is only the United States, even that is, has the limitations. So there is no real superpower which can fully exercise its uh, role. Secondly, let me also tell you something, and you can do some research on that, that in the past 20th and 21st century, let us say, none of the superpowers have won a single war. Let me tell you, China lost in Vietnam, USA lost in Vietnam and Afghanistan, and left in a very miserable manner. Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan and got disintegrated. I doubt very much that Russia would be able to win this war also decisively without getting that terribly impacted. So being a superpower, so that's why when we look at the India, uh, India's growth story or India, what it wants to be, I think it wants to set standards, moral standards. It wants to be a moral superpower in that sense of the term rather than just being seen as a big brother or a, or a country that can enforce things. So you, if you, you would like to become a more of a, a country that follows or projects soft power, but has adequate uh, hard power uh, to look after itself completely. Now, that is how I look at it in India. So in that sense, India today, like I, I tell you that, uh, when we had this International Yoga Day proposal in the United Nations, uh, largest number of countries across the world, Muslims, this, that, all kinds of countries, supported it, uh, supported India. And you know, it became the International Yoga Day, Mahatma Gandhi. Is this. So when you are going in the international domain, we have the largest number of people supporting you, countries supporting you. It shows that you have arrived on the international scene. And so I look at it, India, that you are a, you will be a strong power uh, which can uh, fight anybody you know if necessary like we are doing currently with china with others but it requires a continuous engagement and continuous strengthening of your military power your diplomatic power your economic power you need we need to remain uh, being economically very very strong then only you can be a superpower and so i think that in that sense i look at india as i said benign superpower a benign superpower which can wield its 
ideas which can convey its uh, good Samaritan acts, uh, which countries uh, will appreciate and are appreciating. I mean, you know that when we send the medicines to uh, to to Brazil, the Brazilian president Lula, the previous uh, not Lula, the previous one uh, Bolsonaro, he said that uh, these this is Sanjeevni booty that has come to us, saved our lives. So countries were so floored by your uh, your gesture uh, and support. So I think that is the way I would look in look at India being a superpower, being the fastest growing economy, being a strong maybe number one, number two economy in the world, and uh, uh, with the largest youth dividend in the world, with greatest opportunity economic opportunities here, so that we can dictate to the world what we want in that sense because of our strengths. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I would request um, Harsh to please ask the question, followed by Abhinav. Harsh? Um, okay, I can uh, read out the question and then also invite um, Abhinav to ask his question. So Harsh is from Rashtriya Raksha University and uh, he asks, what can be a suitable world order for India, bipolar or multipolar in the changing changing dynamics of post-pandemic era. Um, I think the know. multipolar world is better for India and India aims uh, for a multipolarity. And that is the reason we are part of so many minilaterals across the whole divide. Uh, but in the worst case scenario, where we have a bipolar world, in that I think India would like to be the third pole. And as I mentioned earlier, we could lead the largest number of congregation of the global countries uh, as nations for strategic autonomy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Abhinav? Abhinav, you can ask your question. You're, you're Abhinav said that he wants you to ask a question. Yes. Uh, you're not audible, Abhinav. Please unmute yourself. Hello, hello. Yes, Am I yes, 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 yes. No, yeah, good evening, Ambassador. Sir. Um, I, I can see that you studied Russian uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and uh, yes. in your profile, and I've also I'm, I'm doing my PhD from Spanish studies, sir. In that sense. Oh, correct. So I just wish to know that when you served, like you you've served in Libya, Malta, and in Russia, any was there ever a time wherein you had to take a call which was uh, like, tell us anything interesting that, 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 you know, that you had to take in personally and, you know, you had, of course, because you've, you've been presenting the government at such a high level, but any call or risk taking that you had to do any, any general interesting stuff, sir, that you did in all these years that you served, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, I tell you very interesting thing since uh, you studied in JNU also, you know, like uh, as diplomats, that's the best part of the uh, uh, job is that you go to difficult places where there is something to do. Uh, something new to do. And the best part about foreign service and the foreign, uh, our establishment is that you have broad contours or the broad guidelines. But at the same time, it's your own initiative. It's your own way, how you how you can better the relationship with the country. How can you serve India's interests? So it's entirely left to you, all your initiatives totally. But I can tell you an interesting, of course, many countries I have served, which are difficult countries. Uh, but the best country, I would say, I mean, there are several examples, but let me just tell you a little bit about Libya when I went there uh, from Moscow. Uh, in Libya, when I arrived there, you know, nobody in Delhi or anywhere knew that at the grassroots level, there was so much of uh, opposition or, or hurt against India at the grassroots level. You know, but the reason was that when the Americans twisted that uh, UN Security Council, we had abstained on it. So when we abstained on it, the Western countries, including uh, the, the Libyans and everybody else, tried to project as if India was with Gaddafi. Now that is something that created during the revolutionary period, people to really hate Indians to that extent. And I arrived in that place without having that background that this was there. I always thought that we had great friendships with the Arabs, they love us and everything, and this is all good. But when you arrive there and you suddenly see a cold shouldering completely, or rather hostile attitude, then there is nobody else who can help you with this. You have to choose yourself, your own methodologies, how you are going to go about doing it, whether you save yourself 
uh, that because see there are people there, there was no law and order there were militias roving around there were wire firing taking place all over or you go and try to 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 solve the situation uh, to the extent possible so this is precisely what i did i mean you know i was I, I was not being received by any government official. Can you imagine? I mean, the ambassador sitting idle in the uh, in the hotel and waiting for his turn to be called by somebody. But then, so you have to get into that. So what I did was, I was sitting in the hotel. I asked the hotel manager, who happened to be an Indian, I said, if you know any uh, person who's uh, somebody in this new system, uh, please let me uh, introduce him. I went there, I go, he told me, sir, he's X, Y, Z, he's so-and-so. I would go and meet everybody morning to evening. I used to sit in the hotel lobby and go and meet new people, telling them I'm the new Indian ambassador to new Libya. <clears throat> and, you know, over time, I used media. I used every single possibility, public platform. Uh, I said that you cannot die twice. So I would go anywhere, irrespective of the threats that were there in the first six months. And I can tell you that later on, when I moved into my residence, I was being protected by the Libyan militias because they thought that I was doing good thing for them. You know, so to, that, to that extent, the situation happened. And I think that that was a great satisfaction as a diplomat. Likewise, when you evacuate Indians from very difficult uh, war zone, I mean, it gives you an immense satisfaction. So there are a lot of things that that at, on this spot you have to decide. There is nobody else to guide you. Nobody else is there to tell you that you do this or you don't do that. You have to take all calls yourself, keeping your own colleagues safe. And that's what biggest priority that as a head of the family we have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there are, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just merge the two questions for you. Um, if you could quickly respond to these. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> raise the hand. Yes, uh, and there are two questions that have been um, yes, please. asked. One is, uh, what role can India play in West Asia in regards to securing its diaspora and resolving regional conflicts? And another one is by Karishma. Con considering the need of the R is to focus on health and environment. How do you view the importance of desecuritizing traditional security concerns in the region of South Asia? Well, the uh, as far as West Asia is concerned, I can say that uh, today our relations with the bilateral relations with nearly every country in the region are at their best. Uh, the the good thing that Prime Minister Modi's government did was to reach out to the um, to, to the countries in the region, especially starting with UAE, Saudi Arabia. We have very large number of strategic partnership with these countries, uh, which have moved into the security and cybersecurity domain and to the um, into defense and other sectors. So the relationship is no longer transactional or buyer seller. It has already become strategic in that context. They are also looking at India as a major. Uh, opportunity, um, an economic opportunity, a defense opportunity. They're looking at India to play a more vibrant role, a more dynamic role in the region. As you must have read recently, the China was able to uh, bring about rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, that is a very big achievement. We need stability in the region because we are importing about 70% of our oil and about 90% of our gas from the region. So obviously, the region has to be secure and stable. And that's what is India's uh, intent is. At the same time, we are also trying to work in the sub-regional manner as the I2U2, as you know, with the United States, with UAE and the Israel and India, that grouping, which is called the, some kind of a Western Quad, West Asia Quad. Now, the, the, those are the kind of groupings are very good. In the G20, as you know, this year, we have also invited the Egyptians, Egyptian president, who was also our chief guest on the uh, Republic Day, uh, we have also invited Oman and UAE, the two other countries which are our partners, to be our guests on the G G20. We have invited people from the neighborhood. And I think that this is what India is trying to do, that trying to have extended, uh, in its extended neighborhood, uh, making it stable. But in my view, over time, this might become a competition of sorts between India and China. The United States is withdrawing from the region, and that is causing a major uh, shift uh, in the regional policies uh, for most of the countries. They, are, they have developed their own activist policy, which means going towards their own markets. Their markets are India and China. And that is why they're looking at it. So I think that 
if our relationship with China continues to be conflictual, it will have a problem in this region as well, which will be a, a, which will have to be watched, and we have to navigate it very very carefully. Um, as far as the health and environment are concerned, uh, the South Asian region is of course uh, very majorly impacted by this. We have seen what is happening in uh, Pakistan after the floods. We have seen what is happening in the natural. Uh, disasters that have been happening and uh, what is happening, political disasters. Uh, and in all these, basically, the environmental dimensions do take a very back seat. And, but India has started many programs, you know, helping uh, neighbors, various countries, especially through renewable energy and all that. I think that that is where uh, the strength of India is that developmental cooperation, capacity building assistance, be it in the healthcare sector or be it the digitalization of the infrastructure, and most importantly, as you know, since we have seen there's 3F, which I mentioned, food, fertilizer, and fuel, which have impacted all the world, especially South Asia much more, and I have written about it, you can see the paper, uh, that the India can, uh, you know, are, is trying very hard that in the G20 context to depoliticize, desecuritize these uh, essentials that are very much necessary for the survival of the humanity. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, quickly, if um, you can allow uh, one more question by uh, yeah. Vitita, could you please uh, ask your question, Vitita? Good evening, sir. My question is related to tech diplomacy. In all the discourses around India being an integral part of emerging new world order and carving its space in identity of a superpower, where do we see its tech diplomacy headed, especially in context of other nations like Israel, whose tech diplomacy the whole world witnessed last year in Iron Dome and Pegasus software? Well, I think that uh, India is an IT superpower, as we all know. The kind of digitalization, uh, uh, the initiatives that India has taken are unique. We are a very large country. You are talking of Israel, which has, of course, done extremely well as an innovative nation uh, in the world with its technologies, as you mentioned. Uh, but at the same time, um, if you come to think of it, that uh, the, the, the next phase of competition among various powers will be the techno technological edge in which R&D plays a very major part. Unfortunately, in India, R&D was not given the kind of uh, status it needed, the kind of investments it required. And therefore, what we are facing now today is the, the laggardness is because of that. But I think that we have, since the 80s, developed the major uh, platform uh, and, the, um, and I would say the, the kind of human resource that is required uh, for an IT revolution, not the whether it is AI, whether it is quantum computing, whether anything else, in all that you require the kind of uh, the the workforce and which is very much there. So that's our advantage. But at the same time, I think as uh, we are doing in India, like various uh, asking all the companies to make in India, Atmanirbhar Bharat, and all those kind of initiatives in which bringing in technology becomes an important part. Uh, uh, dimension of any uh, manufacturing partnership that we'll have with those countries or development partnerships we'll have with other countries. So while we are ourselves exporting technologies and equipment and other things, on the other hand, we are looking at high-tech uh, requirements. And I agree with you totally, the tech diplomacy, uh, which is an extremely important part. And I have been suggesting to the uh, to the government that, you know, every year we have a large number of IITs and the engineering graduates who join the foreign service. Let us try to create a critical mass of these tech diplomats. And they should be posted to the key countries which are good in uh, uh, technologies or well-known in the countries so that we can have, we all we should be on the same level, not like generalists like me uh, who don't understand the technology that well, only know how to use it. But those people who are technologically savvy uh, would be good diplomats in that sense of the term to identify the kind of technologies that we need. So yes, the, the technological superiority will dictate your place in uh, the global scheme of things tomorrow. Thank you so much, sir. It has been wonderful listening to you and uh, thank you very much for your proactive responses to all the questions that have been raised.
Uh, even you. though there are more questions, uh, we'll um, keep you informed and we'll uh, email them to you and uh, at your convenience, kindly respond to them. Thank you very yeah. much for spending your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. All the, all the very Thank best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, I would now request Ashwaj to move ahead with the session. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I would like to invite our second expert for today's session, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya. Professor Bhattacharya will be speaking on India's G20 presidency, implications for India's foreign policy. Professor Bhattacharya is a retired professor of international relations, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, welcome. Good evening, Sim. Yes. yes. Ma'am, uh, we have, uh, say, around 20, 25 minutes for your lecture so that we can have more of interaction. Uh, okay, maybe I'll take about 25 minutes or so. Yeah, uh, sure. Let me uh, share the screen and I hope it comes through. Uh, Um, okay. Uh, you can just do F five or, or uh, yeah. Has it come? On full screen. In fact, here it's is not. It's oh, okay. Not showing uh, full screen. Slide. Uh, just a minute, please. Or ma'am, if you suggest, we can share it. No problem. Uh, I change the order of things. Uh, F5 oh, okay. 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 So in that case, ma'am, you can go to. Can you, can you see the home home insert design animation slideshow at the top left top? Yeah. Home, then insert, yeah, the slideshow, animation, slideshow, design, yeah. Slideshow, yeah. Yeah, from mm -hmm. beginning, from beginning, yeah. No, no, from beginning. From you beginning. cancel this one. You can cancel yes. this one first. Uh, okay. Ah. Usme, ma'am, left. Uh, left. Ah. Uh, right, from beginning. Yes. Okay. Now, can you see it? It should come. Okay, ma'am, you can click there again. Mm. Now? Uh, Actually, no. normally it comes even with this, but uh, it doesn't seem to be coming. Uh, um, but no problem, ma'am, you can go ahead with this. No, you can continue with this one. I, no problem. Yeah, I, I do uh, just that. Okay. It's the same thing that I sent you, but you know, I mean, the order has been changed a little bit. I realized that you not put uh, things. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, first, let me, in fact, thank you because this is, uh, we are already late. So let me thank uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar uh, and the moderators here for inviting me uh, to speak at uh, this very uh, significant course uh, at a significant time. Now, today is the final day and much has already been said on the subject, yet uh, it is important to take uh, the participants here uh, through certain important facts uh, to come to a proper assessment of what the G20 presidency, which is actually a routine thing, and yet an important milestone in India's emergence as a global player uh, to come to a balanced assessment of its possible implications uh, for India's foreign policy. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is just the beginning. We are yet at an early stage and we'll have to wait for the events to play out completely over the course of this year before we can give a true account of India's role in balancing centrifugal forces at play in global politics and its consequent impact on India's standing in world affairs. In fact, I'm going to uh, uh, talk more about actually uh, the G20. And I may sound a bit skeptical uh, since many of the others I've uh, been listening to actually, they are more hopeful about uh, um, India, but I think we should also see the other side. Now, uh, my talk is uh, divided into uh, uh, five sections. Uh, uh, I will first introduce G20's priorities over this year and explain why it is uh, still important and then discuss India's priorities and examine the G20 agenda uh, in the context of uh, 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 basically the, uh, G the broader G20 vision and mission. 
the third section will examine geopolitics and real politics in the context of G20, as well as India's focus on the global south at a time of wide divergences uh, uh, among some of the major powers in the world. Now, much has been said about this, so I'm not really going to go into details over here. The fourth section will make an assessment of the foreign minister's meeting held earlier this month. Uh, with the concluding section focusing on possible outcomes for India's foreign policy. Uh, it uh, must have already been mentioned earlier uh, in the earlier lectures that the G20 is a group of 19 countries and the EU comprising the most important developed countries and emerging uh, economies of the world, thus bringing together the world's major advanced and emerging economies. In fact, it was created in response to the financial crisis of the 1990s and the growing realization that the uh, emerging economies that bore the brunt of the crisis were not adequately represented in global economic discussions or governance. It was founded in 1999 as a forum for finance ministers and bank governors to discuss global economic and financial issues. But following the global economic and financial crisis of 2007-2008, it was uh, upgraded to the level of uh, heads of state and government and was designated the uh, premier forum for international economic cooperation. This is important because international economic, economy, finances and trade, as well as economic issues like tariffs, supply chains, food and energy security, etc., are all part of international relations and foreign policy. But here again, we are talking about economic issues. And in fact, the G20, uh, which seems to be going off track and discussing other issues, uh, and this has happened over the years, okay, but uh, it was actually formed to discuss economic issues. Uh, the forum, in fact, initially focused on macroeconomic issues, but then expanded its agenda to include trade, sustainable development, health, agriculture, energy, environment, climate change, and anti-corruption. Interestingly, uh, international organizations across the board, like the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the ILO, the OECD, uh, and these are all, except for the UN, of course, which also deals with the economy, most of them deal with economic issues. And in fact, the, uh, India has invited also the Asian Development Bank and others. Uh, also, it includes uh, regional organizations like the African Union, the ASEAN countries, uh, they're invited. Its objectives still include policy coordination between its members to achieve global economic stability and sustainable growth, to provide financial uh, regulation that redu reduces risk and prevent future financial crisis, and to create a new financial architecture. I will later examine whether or how the focus of India's uh, agenda for the G20 presidency coincides with these ob objectives. Also, to understand the importance of these objectives is to understand the importance of the G20. This uh, forum, basically, uh, th this group, uh, and here, in fact, let me put up the next slide. Uh, well, uh, its membership accounts for over 80% of the world economy, uh, over that is basically uh, trade, uh, uh, nearly over, actually, not near, nearly 80%, that is. Over 75%, certainly, the figures are different in different uh, um, documents, uh, basically uh, of world trade. And 65%, some say 60%, 65% of the world's population, and also 79% of the world's carbon emissions. Now, these figures uh, are important because they show that basically this group uh, can if it has the political will to do so, take decisive action on some of the most important issues, economic issues facing the world. Now, uh, also these figures have remained fairly stable while the corresponding figures for the G7, which is a smaller group of advanced democracies has, has shrunk. Um, basically because the larger emerging markets now occupy a larger share of the world's economy. In fact, the G20 membership is more representative of the current international balance of power than the G7, uh, because several rising democracies like Brazil, India, Indonesia are part of the G20, uh, which also includes influential autocratic countries like China and Saudi Arabia, 
Russia, which was suspended indefinitely from the G7 following uh, the Russian annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014, is a member of G20. So the most important economies of the world who could shape macroeconomic policy are G20 members. Initially, uh, the G20 focused on, as I said, uh, macroeconomic issues and uh, was quite successful, for instance, following the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the G20 uh, states agreed to spending measures worth about $4 trillion, $4 trillion uh, to basically revive the economies. They rejected trade barriers and implemented far-reaching reforms of the financial system. Uh, at the Seoul summit in uh, 2010, as you can see over here, I've given the summits uh, over here, uh, not exactly what uh, they did, but it's important to follow because I will talk about these. Uh, the 2010 summit was the first summit held in an Asian country, uh, South Korea. Uh, and South Korea, with its own developmental experience, pushed the G20 uh, beyond monetary and macroeconomic issues and brought development to the main agenda. Uh, since then, in fact, uh, what has been called the development track uh, or the South Korean development track uh, has become an important part of the discussions. And later, much of South Korea's uh, development uh, track agenda was incorporated into Agenda 2030 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In subsequent summits, uh, other priorities emerged in agendas. For instance, in the 2017 summit hosted by Germany, uh, Germany drilled down issues like corruption, money laundering, uh, international tax havens, and so on. While the 2016 uh, Hangzhou summit, which was in China, here, in fact, US President Obama and Chinese President Xi Jinping formally announced their country's accession to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Specific foreign policy issues have also come up from time to time. For instance, the G20 discussed how to address a covert Iranian nuclear plant at the 2009 summit and debated how to administer a partial ceasefire in Syria at the 2017 summit. But one must remember that decisions at the G20 are made by consensus. They are supposed to be unanimous. And the implementation of the agenda depends, in fact, on the political will of the member states. And this uh, is very, very important because herein lie the difficulties faced by multilateral platforms as diverse as the G20, to take climate change as a case in point. This has been a focus of recent meetings, but few uh, concrete commitments have come up uh, in uh, any of the G20 meetings. At the Rome 2021 summit, countries agreed to curb emissions of methane uh, and end public financing of most new coal power plants overseas. But nothing was said about limiting the domestic use of coal. At the 2022 summit, Indonesia agreed to close coal power plants in exchange for $20 billion in financing from high-income countries, including the US. But given the issue of scarcity of energy supplies following the Ukraine war, the outcome is yet to be gauged. Moreover, reportedly, China, India, and Saudi Arabia blocked an agreement on uh, pushing, uh, phasing out a coal use and fossil fuel subsidies at a July uh, 2021 meeting of, of environment ministers. Now further, the G20's longstanding commitment to an international order based on the uh, principles of the WTO of reducing tariff and other trade barriers has collided in recent years with the growing economic competition between great powers, especially the US and China. In fact, the US uh, President Donald Trump launched a multi-front trade war involving several G20 members imposing a switch of tariffs on China that the Biden administration has largely left in place. The fact is that the gap between the interests of the low-income uh, countries and the high-income countries, uh, and also among the high-income countries, is growing. Uh, competition among the major powers is also growing. It is in the context of all this, as well as current geopolitical realities, that one must place India's G20 presidency. What is important is that it is no longer a forum that discusses only macroeconomic issues, which of course involves diplomacy and foreign relations, but a wide range of issues that are purely in the realm of foreign affairs, like the uh, Iranian nuclear plant or the Syrian war. Uh, and of course, currently the war in Ukraine, which has been 
dominating not only the G20, but here, in fact, this entire course, I've been hearing about basically the war in Ukraine, uh, which has put, put Western Europe, the US and advanced economic countries like Japan, which actually uh, has supported uh, the sanctions uh, that the West has put against Russia and of course, China. India has so far done a balancing act on the Ukraine war, refraining from condemning uh, the aggression by Russia while pushing for a diplomatic solution. It wishes to keep both sides happy. And since it has uh, increased border tensions with China, it cannot afford to alienate Moscow on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is tapping into Western tensions with China to deepen its relations with the US and Europe. As a result, despite all it says, India has a tight rope to walk during its G20 presidency. Another point needs to be highlighted here, and I don't think others have made this point. India's general elections are slated for 2024. It is in the interest of the current administration at the center, the current government at the center, uh, to play both to an international audience, whom it wishes to impress by putting a stamp on its global rise, as well as the domestic audience to whom it wishes to showcase the G20 presidency as a spectacular event and a grand success so that it can win another spectacular victory at the next elections. Now, most of the Indian population does not know that the G20 presidency is routine. Uh, so basically, uh, and it's not one or anything like that. Uh, as you can see here, there are these five groups and from uh, these five groups, basically uh, it's already, uh, the next one we know is going to be Brazil. Uh, and uh, the year after that also is kind of uh, fixed. So uh, they decide as to which area is going to be, I mean, which region is going to be represented by which country, uh, which is a member of the G20 presidency. So on the one hand, India, which sets the agenda for this year's G20 has prioritized non-controversial developmental issues. And on the other, it has included so-called cultural initiatives like the Special University Connect event with 75 Indian educational institutions across the country. Now, Mark, uh, these are not G20 countries, uh, universities from G20 countries, but just Indian universities. Uh, also the highlighting of 100 ESI monuments with the G20 logo colors, showcasing the G20 at the Hornbill Festival of Nagaland. Um, well, why? And uh, sand artist Sudarshan Patnaik making a, a sand art, uh, basically of the uh, India uh, of the G20 logo on Puri Beach. This of course has nothing to do with India's priorities at the multilateral uh, platform, but everything to do with showcasing its so-called achievements in hosting the G20 summit during uh, the BJP's self-styled Amrit Khan to the domestic audience. The theme of uh, India's G20 presidency is also uh, in line with its self-proclaimed Amrit Khan. It is based on India's religious, socio, cultural, historical background, Vasudeva Vaikuntakam, uh, Kutumbakam, which, uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, uh, which, has, which has been translated into one earth, one family, one future. According to India's official G20 website, India affirms the value of all life, human, plant, animal, microorganisms, and the interconnectedness on earth and with the universe, which is a kind of contemporary interpretation uh, of an ancient credo and can be stretched to mean inclusive development. If this can be taken as a vision statement, the priorities are more clearly put. Uh, these include green development, uh, climate finance and lifestyle uh, uh, for environment, accelerated inclusive and resilient growth, accelerated progress on sustainable development goals, uh, technological transformation and digital public infrastructure, multilateral institutions for the 21st century, and women-led development. In short, India wishes to push for inclusive development, green development, technological transformation, and reform of multiple uh, multilateral institutions, all very basically uh, clear uh, uh, agendas. Uh, India, ever since... Um, and even before its independence at the Asian Relations Conference has spoken for the smaller states that are really re represented in global forums. In fact, 
India possibly sees this G20 presidency as an opportunity to again be a voice for the global south in the 21st century context. Uh, in fact, external affairs uh, minister S. J. Shankar said as much at the University Connect program. And let me quote, we must become the voice of the global south that is otherwise underrepresented in such forums. And this is very laudable. Uh, again, in fact, Prime Minister Modi, uh, while taking over the G20 presidency, uh, asserted that, and I'm quoting, our priorities will be shaped in consultation with not just our G20 partners, but also our fellow travelers in the global south. He added, and I'm quoting, we shall present India's experiences, learnings, and models as possible templates for others particularly the developing world. In fact, some initiatives have already been taken, which indicate that India wishes to uh, basically be more inclusive of smaller underrepresented states and even small industries. Uh, a development working group has been set up to discuss development issues in developing countries, LDCs and island states, that is small island developing states or SIDS. There is also a startup 20 engagement group, which is actually quite novel. This has been planned to be set up this year. This recognizes the role of startups in driving innovation uh, that responds to a rapidly changing global scenario. A new working group on disaster risk reduction will also be set up this year to encourage collective work uh, by the G20 on disaster management. And of course, small states uh, will, they do need help in disaster management. These are all very well. And if all was well, India could put its mark on the G20 uh, by pushing forward its agenda of inclusive development and getting commitments from the world's most advanced and emerging economies. However, the presidency comes at a time of uh, compounding existential uh, threat uh, accelerated by the war in Ukraine that has led to food scarcity and soaring energy prices, as well as inflationary pressures that have led over 100 countries to request uh, emergency assistance from the IMF since the beginning of the pandemic, which disrupted supply chains, led to negative GDP growth, unemployment, and enhanced poverty. Moreover, India has to really use its diplomatic skills to navigate the toxic nationalisms of member countries. The group includes the world's biggest strategic competitors, the US and China, as well as some of the world's most bitter rivals, the US and Russia, China and South Korea, China and Japan, and so on. So much so that geopolitical analysts, Ion Bremer and Nouriel Rubini have argued that the G20's utility uh, is actually over more or less, saying that a G0 world is emerging, one in which countries go it alone or form ad hoc coalitions to pursue their interests. The fact that multilateralism itself was in crisis was evident at the 2022 Bali summit. Uh, although the host country had uh, put forward an agenda around three pillars of post-pandemic macroeconomic policy, that is global health architecture, digital transformation, and uh, sustainable energy transition, deliberations were dominated completely by the Ukraine war. Finally, a joint declaration was issued at the summit, deploring in stringent terms and I'm quoting, aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine and calling for immediate withdrawal of Russian troops. This was adopted with the caveat that some member states had, and I'm quoting, other visions and different assertions, uh, assessments of the situation and sanctions. A similar lack of unanimity was, uh, was observable at this year's finance ministers meeting at ba Bengaluru, which failed to basically agree on a joint statement after the meeting. As the G20 is the premier forum for international economic cooperation, this meeting of finance ministers and central bank governors should have been the most important, or at least one of the most important events uh, for talks on development. But the Russia-Ukraine conflict received more attention than economic issues, and both Russia and China declined to sign the joint statement which criticized Moscow's invasion. That left India to issue a chair summary and outcome document in which it uh, summed up the two days of talks and acknowledge the disagreements. This is not the same as issuing um, a consensus document unanimously adopted, a consensus statement. The same thing was repeated at the foreign ministers meeting in New Delhi on 1st, 2nd uh, March. This was much hyped uh, and attended by both the US Secretary of State and the minister, uh, uh, Russian uh, Foreign Secretary, but in which interestingly, Japan's and South Korea's foreign ministers were conspicuous by their absence. Now, both these countries are very important for in not only G20, but also for India, where in fact, both invest heavily. 
uh, and their last minute absence was significant. Uh, while both US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Secretary Sergei Lavrov uh, emphasized their respective countries' privileged relationship with India, and this is something that, of course, has been touted uh, by our media, they use strong terms to lash out against each other, uh, with Lavrov calling Western sanctions, and I'm quoting, stealing natural resources from our countries, and Blinken accusing Russia of being responsible for the worsening global food security situation, and uh, saying that Putin, Putin was, and I'm quoting, weaponizing the hunger of people across the globe. Our external affairs minister, Jay Shankar, acknowledged that there was very polarized views, uh, but also claimed that the participants agreed on key issues facing the global economy, like debt, distress, and food and energy security. But the outcome was the same as the finance minister's meeting, uh, as there was no agreement on a joint statement, and the chair had to provide only a summary and outcome uh, document. Interestingly, another meeting, and this is something that has to be noted. Uh, 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 basically, another missing, uh, meeting was held right after, on 3rd March, um, following the FMN. This was the Quad ministerial meeting. And of course, you all know that the Quad, US, Japan, India, and Australia, has a strong anti China defense element. A joint statement on deeper uh, cooperation in multiple domains to ensure a free and open Indo Pacific was issued. And of course, I mean, this was expected. Russia and China both immediately criticized this as confrontational. And especially, they pointed out that the decision to hold the meeting right after the G20 uh, foreign ministers' meeting was, well, it was not done. I mean, in fact, you wonder why the, uh, this was held right after that. Maybe because the minister, the, the foreign secretaries and ministers were there, but uh, still, uh, well, still dot, dot, dot. Now, the acrimony within the G20 uh, members was especially evident in the Raisina dialogues, which followed the Quad uh, meeting on 4th March. Here, the Russian foreign minister came through as angry and assertive, even against the Indian moderator. And the EU leader assert, asserted that uh, UN reforms can wait till after the Ukraine war ends and the world overcomes the challenge of climate change, thus putting cold water in India's hopes of talks on reform of multilateral bodies, uh, reform of the UN and the G20. Now, all this does not augur well for India's foreign policy during the G20 presidency. There was much talk in the Indian and foreign media through the first two months of this year about India's ability to balance uh, relations with all sides uh, since it follows the middle path, giving it credibility with all sides. While it is true that India's economic, military, and diplomatic stature makes it indispensable for any grouping in the Indo-Pacific to balance China's rise, and it's also true that India has strong historic ties with Russia, from whom, in fact, it buys is the largest. In fact, it's the only entity we came up with figures about how much basically uh, India buys from Russia, uh, weaponry, armaments. Uh, but it must also be remembered, and in fact, this is my feeling, it could be yours too. Um, India does not seem to have any particular leverage with either the US and its Western allies or with Russia that would make it an important player in bringing the divisive uh, gaps caused by the Ukraine conflict to a close. Under the circumstances, India, as clear from Jay Shankar's statement following the foreign minister's meeting, would like to focus on its priority issues, that is green economy, financial stability, sustainable and inclusive economic development. It certainly does not want its G20 agenda to go off track because of the acrimonious Ukraine conflict. However, here too, certain questions are relevant. Apart from some, in fact, I would come back to this uh, slide because I want you to also kind of think about these and give me your answers. Um, basically, uh, apart from some broad references to energy, food, and debt issues, uh, and talk of development and the global uh, south, India's G20 presidency still has to come out with a specific long-term agenda. Just uh, like, for instance, South Korea's Development Act Agenda of 2010, um, which was a detailed document that changed the G20 narrative. Uh, most of India's G20 documents are either broad generalizations like one earth, one family, and one uh, future, or focus on the strengths of the Indian economy and Indian initiatives without exploring how these can be leveraged to draw up a development plan for the global south 
or women-led development or digital trans uh, transformation. This may be important for the immediate dissemination to an Indian audience, but if they do not help to push the G20 uh, economic agenda forward or help to unite members, these narratives will not last beyond India's presidency in the world stage. Additionally, there is an emerging platform, uh, the collapse of two large banks in the US that catered to the tech industry, which is reminiscent of the housing bubble that burst 15 years ago, causing a financial crisis all over the world, which in fact led to the strengthening uh, uh, of the G20 as a multilateral platform. The pace of collapse is fast and uh, does not bode well for the global financial stability. It has spread already to uh, Swiss banks and to basically European banks also, even though the US is trying to cap the issue. Now, this may impact India's G20 agenda for the global south. So can India leave a permanent stamp on multilateralism or the G20 during its presidency? So far, there is no evidence of any breakthrough or any uh, consensus that uh, India can engineer. However, it can still change the narrative by taking a positive lead in focusing on developing nations issues and steering discussions that stick to the point rather than applauding the fact that the foreign ministers of Russia uh, and uh, America met and the Indian foreign minister spoke to the Chinese foreign minister on the sideline. There was no tangible outcome from either of these meetings. And there is no point in talking the fact that this happened on Indian soil because they led to nothing. Instead, India can still prepare a doable framework of cooperation between the OECD led global development architecture and South-South cooperation and develop it into a kind of 2023 G20 idea, which is acceptable to all. Uh, India could present an entirely new development track for the next decade instead of platitudes and thus fulfill its ambition to lead as it has itself proclaimed, and I'm quoting, inclusive, ambitious, action-oriented and decisive G20 presidency. Thank you. Uh, Good lecture. Hello. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for your very deep insights and um, wonderful lecture. It is um, really, really, uh, we are really grateful for uh, for it. I would request um, Ashwash to please ask his question. And in the meantime, if uh, the participants also have a question. Right, uh, ma'am, it was really nice listening to you. It was really informative. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to uh, explore other areas as well in your speech. Uh, Ma'am, when you mentioned about India's implications, right, especially post the G20 summit. Uh, Ma'am, there's on one side, we have China playing the peacemaker, the broker in the Middle East with Iran and Saudi Arabia, which happened recently. Uh, it might have implications with the Iran nuclear deal. On the other hand, Ma'am, uh, there's the Palestine question. So uh, given that there's a retreatment or a withdrawal of the US from the Middle East or West Asia or from this region, there is increased competition between India and China that we can see, especially in places like Africa or West Asia. So given these uh, new uh, revelations, how do you see um, the Palestine question panning out in the future, especially with something like a super giant like China? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, uh, it's a question that has been bothering the international community since 1948, ever since, in fact, uh, Israel was formed. And, uh, well, um, it has not worked out yet, right? Uh, now, whether India, India, in fact, was uh, earlier, uh, it did not have relations with uh, Israel. It did after a few years, uh, which is, of course, very covered and all that, but uh, uh, it did not have open relations with Israel. Uh, but of course, uh, the Arab world was part of the non-aligned movement and therefore, in fact, it had to take a stand. Now, basically, I think that uh, uh, whether having relations with Israel has spoiled its kind of, or rather it has questioned its credibility with Palestine, with the Palestinians, uh, that is a question. We do not know. We have not heard from that side. Now, to be able to engineer any kind of, you see, uh, brokerage between two sides, you need to have credibility with both sides, okay? Uh, 
I see, of course, India having good relations with Israel, but do you see Palestine in the news at all? Or Palestinian leaders in the news at all? Earlier, in fact, there was Arafat who was coming and, well, he was very much part of Nolan. But now, in fact, do you at all read about India and Palestine? So I, I, uh, your question, in fact, uh, I really cannot answer it because as I said, to be a broker, you need to have credibility with both sides, not with one side, right? And so I, I don't think that, of course, it will come, uh, but there'll be others. The United States is never going to let go because the uh, uh, United States is never going to let Israel go. So basically, you know, United States will always be there. I mean, uh, it may move out of the other parts of West Asia, but certainly not uh, basically the Israel, uh, or Israel Palestine uh, issue will be at the bottom or rather at the heart of its West Asia initiatives. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for your response. Um, ma'am, uh, the question that you have raised uh, at the end uh, in, in this uh, slide, which is visible to all of us, um, uh, is it, uh, is it uh, really a question that uh, India's development agenda is going off the track in the G20 meetings? Because if we are um, able to invite uh, all the world leaders and um, you know, telling them about uh, India's growth trajectory and also having um, more and more FDIs and um, even holding the meetings in uh, tier one and tier two cities. So uh, do you think uh, this, this uh, is a question which is worth uh, considering? Of course, it is worth considering because in fact, as you see, uh, as we saw last year, I mean, they really didn't come, with, uh, come up with any kind. Uh, in recent years, has the G20 come up with any kind of uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, uh, in 2010, of course, there was a South Korea, the development track, which was developed. And subsequently, also, there have been commitments. But in the last few years, I mean, so far as commitments are concerned, ever since particularly the Ukraine war started, that's last year, all right, I said, you do not find agreement, all right? And in fact, uh, what, uh, you know, India is showcasing itself. But will it leave a permanent stamp? On it as such on uh, G20, it can do so only if it comes up with an agenda which is successful. All right. So far, we've had the finance minister's meeting, we've had the foreign minister's meeting, the two most important meetings, all right, as such, of uh, uh, the G20 before the summit. Okay. The others are there, environment ministers, etc. Those are important, but these two are really crucial meetings. They're the most important meetings. And what you find is that uh, neither of them could come up with a uh, unanimously accepted consensus document or data such a statement. Now, uh, that, is what is, uh, that is what is important. If they cannot come with a, uh, with a unanimous consensus document with a statement, joint statement, which is acceptable to all, uh, then it has no meaning, right? It's just a document, okay? So, uh, well, let's see what happens at the summit. But as I said, we are not really looking at what has been happening in the last few days. You see the bank failure, in the United States. And if you look at today's news also, uh, you'll be finding that more banks are, you know, the Swiss uh, uh, banks, or right, some of them are being affected. And then of course, uh, they're spreading to Europe. Now, United States want to cap it, all right? And in fact, they were trying to say yesterday that uh, things are under control. Uh, regulators are already looking into these two banks which have failed. Now, uh, both the Silicon Valley Bank and the other one, they have heavy investments in India, right? In the tech sector. Okay, so the failure of banks, are we heading towards another kind of crisis? All right, uh, basically which will, uh, which will make, the, um, make financial stability volatile, okay? In which case, again, there'll be problems uh, with the G20 will, might it disrupt, basically it might put India off track, all right, completely, because it is looking at development issues, it is. Um, but as I said, you know, I talked about the domestic audience and the international audience. In fact, uh, uh, we are showcasing India to both the domestic audience and the Indian audience, uh, sorry, and the international audience, okay? But what exactly are we planning to do when we're saying that we want women-led development? Give me one this thing where they've said, what do they mean by women-led development? Okay, which is one, uh, which is a priority area, right? But what is there? What, what, what have we done? I mean, is there any document which says that what they mean by women-led development, okay? 
uh, or for the matter digital transformation, they said that you can adopt the Indian model and the Chinese say that they can adopt the Chinese model. Now, these are models, but is there a framework which will be acceptable to all? And that is what is important. Okay. Get thank you. Thank you. Raise these questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, if you could just uh, stop the share screen, if possible. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Um, uh, Abhinav, we'll provide uh, you with uh, Sanjukta ma'am's uh, email ID with your permission, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, they'd like to connect with you for more questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, it was really informative today. And we look forward to your continued guidance. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank it was you. a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. We really learned a lot. Um, Abhina, uh, sorry, uh, Ashwash, if you could uh, invite our next and final speaker for the day. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we'd like to move on to our third and the final expert for today's session. Uh, we have with us Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi, who will be speaking on the new frontiers of Indian foreign policy. Uh, professor Ch Chaturvedi is the professor and chairperson at the Department of International Relations, South Asian University. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and over to you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, let me see if I can put up my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Just give me a second, please. Oh, dear. It says that I have to do something on the security and privacy. What is that? So you can also send it to us, maybe email it to us and we can also. Let me see again because. If you can just guide me when you go to security and privacy, right? Um, no, sir, what sir, do you, you click on? It will just sir, take us a couple of. Yeah, sir, you can go to share screen, the middle uh, button at the bottom, green button, share screen. Can you see it? Yeah, I did that. Okay, after that, sir, uh, a window will pop up. Then do you have it the. Says, it says open? share, allow Zoom to share your screen. Then it says open system preferences. Oh. Sir, are you using a Mac? Okay, it is a MacBook. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. MacBook. Okay. Um, then, um, then it will take uh, some time. You will have to then do some settings. There is, there is something called firewall. Yes, uh, yes, then... that's what is stopping you. And then it has to restart. Your computer has to restart. You know. Sir, if you can just email to us. Yeah, that would be much easier. Okay, let me see that. Okay, yes. just give me a second. In the meantime, participants can take a short break. I have sent it, so.
Sir, you have got it. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. In the meanwhile, while we open Sir's presentation, uh, the participants are requested to participate in this poll. From the IFP point of view, which country is most important for India? Your options are US, UK, China, Russia, and Japan. I think uh, we could end the poll and see the results. Are you able to open it? Yes, sir. Great, wonderful. Thank you. So this is very fascinating. The uh, the participants' views on uh, the importance of the country. Nobody has mentioned UK is important for India. Is most important for India. <laughs> right. The most important is Japan, followed by Russia and China, and then US. Interesting. Yes. It really speaks a, a lot on India's foreign policy. Yes, so we could start with the presentation. Wonderful. So we can uh, blow it fully. Yeah, there we are. So first of all, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, very good evening to all of you. I'm very grateful uh, for this invitation to IMPRI um, and uh, very happy to be a part of this conversation. Uh, in the time that has been allotted to me, uh, what I intend to do is to uh, focus on uh, geographies, uh, pluralizing geography of uh, Indian foreign policy, and talk about both the constants and changing contours in uh, what I think is the overarching context of the Anthropocene. My submission is that uh, in order to understand the importance of India's presidency of G20, it is very important uh, to take a look at this intersection of the constants and the changing, you know, the change and continuity. And we have to sort of locate it uh, in, the, in the broader, larger context of the kinds of challenges uh, that we all uh, face. Now you will see that uh, on the opening slide, uh, there is a collage, right? Firstly, you can see that there's a spinning globe. And the reason I have this particular image is because I wish to argue that we live in what can be described as an interregnum. All centuries have their interregnums. And it is during a particular interregnum, uh, and last one, by the way, was at the beginning of the 20th century, when we had the formulation of some of the geopolitical, classical geopolitical theories. I'll come to that a little later. And the more recent interregnum is, uh, is, is still unfolding before us. Interregnum is, uh, is a moment uh, when we find transitions, when we find transformations, 
when we find uh, knowledge power shifts, sometimes uh, we see power shifts, but perhaps not uh, knowledge shifts as much as, as we would like to uh, see that particular uh, change, that particular shift. So this is where this is where we are in the larger context, and and interregnums always create a lot of uncertainties. Now you will see that on the collage, uh, I have uh, shown some images of. Firstly, you can see the subcontinent on one side, and it is important to bear in mind that uh, when we talk about the subcontinent, it's very much a part of the larger space called Eurasia. And it is an eco-geographical region, right? All regions are constructions. Uh, so is South Asia. And the term South Asia, as you know, is a very geopolitical label. But the fact of the matter is that it is an eco-geographical region. So the countries on the subcontinent are joined by the hip, uh, ecologically speaking. You will also see some images of uh, climate change impacts. Uh, you will see, for example, just before the spinning globe, uh, the Bay of Bengal, you will see, I'm, I'm inviting your attention to BIMSTEC, which is a sub-regional scale. You can see I'm inviting your attention to the Arctic Council where India is present. Uh, India is also very active as a consultative member in the Antarctic Treaty System. And India is a very important player in Indian Ocean Rim Association. So there are all these dots waiting to be connected. And I think this is an important point because when we talk about India's G20 presidency, what is it that we are talking about? Are we talking about an exercise in statecraft, elitist foreign policy or diplomacy, or we are talking about a movement? And this is how I would like to look at it. A movement uh, in support of, given my own discipline, my, my own location in the discipline of international relations, a moment which should also help us rethink the dominant mainstream theories of international relations, foreign policies and diplomacy should enable us, should encourage us to think very differently about, about the way we have learned international relations or foreign policy narratives and help us in broadening and deepening the nature and scope of international relations, making it more, more global, more, more non-risk. And that is the reason that I don't look at the successes and failures narrative of G20. I think it is quite premature in my opinion. I look at it as a, as, as a movement, multi-scalar, multi-spatial, it signals the, the, the fact that power is shifting. It talks about the return and rise of India as a part of the larger rise and return and rise of Asia. And it is, it is this particular point that I would like to uh, flag uh, in the course of my presentation. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a reading which, uh, which I have, uh, I have uh, shared with you. And I'll request you uh, that as I go, as I mention the next slide, please change the slide, right? Uh, because on the other, another laptop, I have, I, have, I have it open in front of me. Now, this is interesting. This Oxford Handbook of Indian Foreign Policy was published in the year 2015. And here I'm making a reference to uh, Professor Kanti Bajpayee's uh, contribution, which is a very fascinating contribution, very, very thoughtful. Uh, a reading which is already with you. It's worth taking a look at uh, these readings with that, that I've given you from the Oxford Handbook of Indian Foreign Policy. The reason I want to spend a little time on this slide is to sort of argue that how dynamic the world is in which we are living, in which we are reflecting, in the world in which we are theorizing about international relations and foreign policy. Now, in this particular contribution, we are told that uh, there is something called post-colonial sovereignty. And remember here, Professor Bajpayee is talking about India's conflict with Pakistan, China, and the United States. Basically, his argument is that this is how 
we have approached india's foreign policy or indian foreign policy these are these are some of the you know primary factors and considerations <clears throat> So when we talk about post-colonial sovereignty, it talks about countries' deep anxieties over threats to territory, nationhood, and independence of decision making. The second is alliance politics, in which India's greatest fear is the United States aligned with Pakistan to the detriment of Indian interests. Again, you can see the changes that have taken place, the shifts that have taken place. Power distribution. India remains concerned about the asymmetries of power that have profoundly affected New Delhi's dealings with Islamabad, Beijing, and Washington. So the power gaps, Professor Bajpayee in his very recent book on India-China also talks about these growing power disparities, not just between, United, between China and India, but also between the United States and China. So it's a very important point that is being made here. Conflict over political values, I quote, interestingly, value differences continue to complicate India's relations, India regards Pakistan's Islamization with deep foreboding, is in tested competition with China's strutting, uh, strutting authoritarianism and remains suspicious of US-led globalization. Domestic politics also plays a very important role. Now, what is interesting is that whereas all these factors, post-colonial sovereignty, alliance politics, power distributions, asymmetries of power, conflict over political values, domestic politics, they all remain important even today. But the very substance, the very nature of these categories is going undergoing profound transformations. For example, if you go to the next slide where I am inviting your attention to another reading that I have shared with you, which is from this FIA report, called Great Power Competition and the Rising U.S.-China Rivalry. Here my narrative is, and I quote from my own, own work, a strange democracy is no longer. The United States of America and India no doubt find themselves in the tight embrace of a strategic partnership. But there is no evidence as yet to suggest that views from India and views on India, especially those of the U.S. converge fully on what, where, and why of the Indo-Pacific. One finds a subtle but significant policy move towards the sub-regionalization of the super maritime region of sub-regions, such as the Bay of Bengal, the Arabian Sea, and the South China Sea. This can also be seen as a conceptual contribution by India to the new meta-geographies of a new planetary multiplex geopolitics where the Indo-Pacific becomes a space, a site, or a laboratory where unconventional meanings of security and sustainability can be tested, operationalized, and even institutionalized at multiple scales. The process of broadening and deepening of India's vision of Indo-Pacific is an evolving one, often articulated in terms of India's look east and act east policy. So the point that I'm trying to drive home here is that India's, the significance of India's G20 presidency has to be seen in the broader context, in the context of India's multi-spatial engagements with the globe, even at the planetary scale. Now, we will, we will, we will, we can return to this uh, in the later part uh, of our conversation. Now, another slide that you see here is my anchoring slide. This is my sort of key argument this evening that India's G20 presidency has to be seen also on this very intriguing intersections of ecological unsustainability, growing frequency and intensity of natural disasters, and the complexity of climate change. And you know that Paul Crutzen uh, is the one, the Nobel Prize winner who talked about Anthropocene and said that we are officially li living in an age, earlier we were living in Holocene, the Anthropocene human dominance of biological, chemical and geological processes on earth is already an undeniable reality. So I'll, I'll return to, uh, to the concept and the context of the Anthropocene in the later part. Now, I think the question, that we need to ask ourselves as students of 
India's foreign policy, Indian diplomacy, international relations, both as a discipline, IR in capital, and also in small letters that are international relations as practices. What Anthropocene is doing to IR and foreign policy and diplomacy, and what international relations, foreign policy, and diplomacy, both theories and practices, can do for the Anthropocene. And I think this is where I look at India's G20 presidency quite differently in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not, I'm not, my, for me, the importance of India's G20 presidency does not lie in asking questions about its successes and failures, but in terms of the impact, social, cultural, ecological, it is having on our thinking political, social, geopolitical, cultural thinking, and the way in which it is forcing us to rethink the geographies and geographs of foreign policy. Geographies, not only physical, but also imagined. And by geographs, I'm talking about the written geographies. Now, if we go to the next slide, the one point that I'm making with all emphasis at my command is that geography matters and locations matter. Now I know a lot is being said. Let us go to the next slide, please. A lot has been said, again, the next slide, on uh, you know, a lot has been said about this um, and should be said, because I think this ancient Indian wisdom uh, has a lot of contemporary relevance, particularly in the era of Anthropocene which I'm going to argue today. Now, there is a very interesting link between Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam and what you see Ambassador Sham Saran mentioning in his very fascinating book, How India Sees the World, you know, from Kautilya to the 21st century. And he says, I quote, and the reason, by the way, you see uh, Dina X book here, India, A Sacred Geography, is because Ambassador Sham Saran does make a very important reference in one of the footnotes in, in this very, very first chapter. He says, in the Mahabharata, the narrator Sanjaya recalls for King Vithrashtra the vision of the entire cosmos as a vast circle of seven concentric oceans separating six regions on Varshas, each with its own monuments and reverses, oh, sorry, mountains and river systems. At the center lies Jambu Dvipa, described in other sacred texts as four petal lotus floating in the ocean with our own Varsha, that is Bharata, defined by the southern petal. It has the Himalayas for its mountain system and mighty rivers, as do the other Varshas and seas surrounding its triangular shape. This is a landscape that is mythical yet hallowed and also recognizably physical. It is a template ingrained in the collective Indian consciousness that continues to shape our view of the world around us. As it has through centuries, irrespective of the rise and fall of empires, this vision has endured in our subconsciousness, prevailing over the political, social, and cultural peculiarities that make India such a diverse country. Now, if we bear this in mind, and then go to the motto of India's G20 presidency, Vasudhaiva Kutum Kam, we can see that when India is talking about Vasudhaiva Kutum Kam, it is talking about Vasudhaiva Kutum Kam not from the self-conceived sense of any kind of superiority, but in the light of what Ambassador Sham Saran says in his next slide. So I'll request you to please display the next slide. Next slide, please. And this is where you see the contrast. A slide before this, please. Just a slide before this, yes. This is, this is, this is quite an important point. Next slide, please. India's worldview is worth examining within the framework of the mandala. 
And you know that in a lot of foreign policy studies, diplomacy studies, when we talk about Mandela, we talk about very often your your if if your neighbor is your is your enemy and enemies, uh, you know, and, and so on and so on. That is not the point. I think uh, I think Mandela has much more to it, and this is what Ambassador Shamsaran is inviting our attention to. Is worth examining within the framework of the Mandela as described in the old treatises uh, treatises on Indian statecraft. Studying the Jambu Dweepa Mandela from our ancient texts, one is struck by the fact that it does not ascribe centrality and superiority to Bharat Varsha, which is only one among the lotus petals that make up our universe. Each of the co-centric circles in the Mandala that radiates outwards is superior to preceding one. This is the reverse of the Chinese worldview, which sees the Han core as the most advanced with increasing larger circles symbolizing the more barbaric and the less civilized. India will never have a middle kingdom concept complex. It accepts a world in which there are other dweepas or islands with their own characteristics and values. You know, very often we talk about unity and diversity in our internal domestic concept. But what Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is doing is that it is, it is sort of upscaling it to what in Anthropocene we are talking about as the planetary scale. Now, it is not a rhetoric. It is not simply symbolism. It has a deep sense of meaning in the sense that it is very much talking to the Zayat it is very much talking to the spirit of the times. It is very much talking to the need of the times, the demands and the imperatives of the times. And this is what I want to sort of uh, illustrate in the rest uh, of my presentation. Now let's go from here to another one of my, uh, you know, I think this, this is an absolutely fascinating book, which I'm sure uh, my young students and scholars have already read through. I can't do full justice uh, to uh, the brilliance of this work, but but let me let me just highlight uh, some of the points, and that is that if you talk about the Anthropocene, this great acceleration, and I will show you a few slides to sort of reinforce my point here. You find that we do live in times of interregnum, as I said, marked by unprecedented uncertainty. And I, have to, I will have a few slides later on uh, to sort of reinforce this point. But for the time being, let us just listen to what uh, Honorable External Affairs Minister of India is telling us. He says, I quote, the world we are poised to enter is a subject of intense argumentation. Please be reminded of argumentative Indian, right? Um, it is, not, it is not a monologue. Vasudhaiva Kutumkam is not a monologue. And that is the reason that I think it is very important that students of international relations, foreign policies, diplomacy should bring Vasudhaiva Kutumkam to their classrooms. They should bring the concept to critical social science laboratories. Why? Because as, as we are told here, it's a, sub, it's, a, it's, it, it's, a, it's a moment of intense argumentation. And India would like to turn these many of these monologues, you know, whether, whether they relate to Anthropocene or to something else, into dialogues and dialogic politics. So the responsibility of making India's G20 presidency, in my view, depends on each and every person here. Academic institutions, centers of higher learning, think tanks, critics, everyone has to engage. To continue with the quote, it is further complicated by transformational changes in politics, economics, and technology. The India way, especially now, would be far more sharper or decider rather than just be an abstainer. This has been already visible on debates like climate change and connectivity. Remember when you talk about climate change, the climate diplomacy, India has taken up a stand of common but differentiated responsibility. Whatever be the demands of international climate diplomacy, 
I think the responsibility also lies on the civil society organizations and academic institutions, intellectuals, to continue to talk about, while acknowledging the challenge of climate change, continue to talk about the ethical moral dimensions of climate change and internalize the principle to the extent it is possible that is common but differentiated responsibility into our domestic reality. To continue, India must be a just and fair power as well, consolidating its position as a standard bearer of the global south. The rise of India, like other aspects of international relations is a story without an ending. The world is not what it was until recently. In its systemic impact, the coronavirus may be the most consequential happening after 1945. The paradox the world will confront is to seek change in the very order in which it is still invested. A more fragmented, diffused and complicated future awaits as all of us will now do our political sums differently. Not everybody is going to have similar narratives, similar conversations, similar understanding. The value of India in such global calculations, <clears throat> regional calculations, sub-regional calculations, local calculations is apparent. It will probably increase as it has even further after the virus, unquote. Now, <clears throat> what happens is that there's no doubt that Westphalian state system remains the most important actor in international relations. But Vasudeva Kutumkam does something else. Again, as I said, it depends on your location. If you are, if you are, look, if you are looking at Vasudeva Kutumkam and you, are, you want to theorize it right, in support of, say, global international relations or non-Western international relations, you can have some very interesting takes on it. For example, my take on this would be that the moment you upscale it, right, the moment you look at the world from your Varsha, Bharat Varsha, the moment you look at it, not as the center, not the way in which the Chinese are doing, but differently, you, you, you start questioning the territorial traps and tropes of international relations and foreign policy narratives. I don't think, you know, or, or to put it differently, I think there's a lot of substance in what we are being told today that Indian diplomacy and Indian foreign policy is not simply the responsibility of Ministry of External Affairs. It remains a nodal agency, but the kind of world in which we live, every academic itself, itself is engaged in academic diplomacy, right? For example, so the territorial traps and tropes, this is where John Agnew's concept of territorial trap becomes very, very important. To what an extent we are able to break through this cartographic imprisonment is something which we must continue to discuss in our classrooms and conversations. I quote, an intellectual or analytical trap in interstate studies, however, it can be generalized to consider the territorial traps of various forms of power at both interstate and substate scales, rather than reflecting an unambiguous sovereignty that ends, begins at a border, or that must be overcome as such. Border thinking should open up to consider territorial spaces as dwellings, rather than national spaces. So the manner in which Vasudhaiva Kutumkam is being described as the world habitat of not just humans, but non-humans together of everyone reinforces the point that is being made here. Political responsibility for pursuit of a decent life as extending beyond the borders of any particular state. Borders matter then, both because they have real effects and because they trapped thinking about and acting in the world in territorial terms, unquote. Next slide, please. Now let us spend just a few slides. And this, since, because these slides are going to be with you, I need not spend a lot of time here. In any case, we don't have much of time this evening with us. So let us be reminded of the Anthropocene. And let us be reminded of the way in which Ontological ruptures are taking place in our understanding, conventional, traditional understanding of international relations, foreign policy, and diplomacy. Let us also be reminded of the fact that diplomacy in this interregnum is not simply the art of possible. 
it is in some ways becoming the art of impossible. How do we move from a present which looks so ecologically unsustainable for this generation to a future that we would want for our children and grandchildren, right? Ecologically secure, socially just, culturally appropriate future. How do we? So, so the kind of challenges that foreign policies, establishments, and diplomacy practices are facing today are really unprecedented. No surprise, the discipline of international relations, area studies, um, they're all, they're all facing serious challenges as a, as, as a pattern of all the entire social science fabric is being questioned. So there are these epistemological conundrums and these are ontological ruptures. Now let's see in what ways. Next slide shows you National Geographic mushroom cloud, right? And this is very graphic. This is very, very graphic. The next slide is reference to a book, which I think is a great book written by Matthew Spark, which my young students and scholars might like to refer to. And Matthew Spark reminds us that ecologically speaking, Earth has always been globalized. Our evolution and health as human beings have been dependent from the start on our interactions with a planetary ecosystem. Nevertheless, the anthropos anthropocentric forms of globalization have fundamentally changed these ecological interdependencies, making us the dominant global species and creating today what some scientists refer to as a new ecological turn, geological era, the Anthropocene. Now, many a time one wonders, when one looks at the agenda of G20 presidency of India, it looks like it's a very long list. These are all dots, right? Waiting to be connected. In fact, they are already connected in many respects. But the problem is that the way in which the, the politics of knowledge production has taken place, the way in which area studies programs have, for example, been dominated in the West, as you all remember that IR was born as a social science discipline in the United States. We all know that area studies program were initiated and flourished in the United States. India, by bringing in the Global South category, which might, many people might contest, but a post-colonial engagement, bringing in of the Global South perspective is a post-colonial engagement, then reminds you of the ways in which we have all been disciplined in terms of our imagination, thinking, innovation, by our respective disciplines of international relations and so on and so on, right? So I think that, that is something which I would like to leave on the table as we move along. Now, very rightly said by Lewis that the first stage of solving our changing relationship, as it says on the next slide, with our environment is recognizing it. So if you take a look at the slide that I've taken from nature, the next slide, this is where the code is. Now, there is no end of geography. Locations matter. There is rewriting of the earth. There is deterritorialization at the same time, re-territorialization. Old borders stand questioned. Sometimes they have become porous. New borders are coming up. Power knowledge shifts are also taking place. As I said, maybe power is shifting, but the knowledge defined as the capacity to act is still not shifting to the extent it should be shifting. So that probably could be another very important takeaways from India's G20 presidency and its emphasis on the global south. Now, this is what is happening on the ground. Bay of Bengal, I will just, just please run through these slides one after the other. This is Bay of Bengal. The way in which the Bay of Bengal is being changed, framed as a, as a, as a climate uh, change black hole. Uh, very securitizing uh, language, I must say. Mumbai floods, next slide. You can see these floods, uh, the, these floods, urban floods, weather patterns are changing. Citizens baffled as shoals of dead fish wash ashore at Goa's beaches. This is what I saw with my own eyes in Mumbai. Uh, you know, the, the beaches were full of dead fish. Next slide, please. You can, you can very slowly run through these slides till we reach the slide, which I really want to share with you uh, or spend a little time, which is this future fate 
of Antarctica's ice sheet is one of the largest uncertainties in climate science. We are not only living in an era of, um, of geopolitical uncertainties, uh, you know, Russia, Ukraine uh, for is just one example, or our neighborhoods uh, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But we are also living in, uh, in, in, in times of scientific uncertainties. If you look, take a look at this slide, future fate of Antarctica's ice sheet is one of the largest uncertainties in climate science. Today, India's voice in the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings is the voice of, in many respects, whether it is the discussion on biodiversity, biological prospecting, climate change, our narratives as observers in the Arctic Council are deeply ecological in their essence. We are underlining the importance of science as a first order value. We are talking about conducting business or trade related activities in these regions uh, in ecologically speaking, very stringent manner. For example, we are talking about regulating Antarctic tourism in an ecologically responsible manner. And the reason for that is that it's not just that the Indian coastlines will be affected, or Indian coastal zones will be affected if there is plastic in the ocean or if there are dead ocean zones, but the entire, entire, entire earth right, uh, will be affected. About 20 meters of global sea level rise is locked up in highly vulnerable parts of the Antarctic ice sheet and is already beginning to melt. Next slide tells you that about 20 meters of global sea level rise is locked up in the highly vulnerable parts of Antarctic ice sheet and already beginning to melt. Now tell me, a lot of our understanding narratives of India's foreign policy and diplomacy have been restricted to interstate relations. We have not paid enough attention to how India's foreign policy, how Indian diplomacy, science diplomacy, for example, has engaged with the question of global commons. We know that there is the recent UN treaty on preserving the biodiversity in the high seas. A lot of work needs to be done. India has recently uh, passed its Antarctic Act, again, confirming India's commitment to the spirit of the Antarctica Treaty of 1959, which says that Antarctica shall forever be used for peaceful and scientific purposes. And we are aware of the fact that about 20 meters of global sea level rise is locked up in the highly vulnerable part of the Antarctic ice sheet, and it is already beginning to melt. So these are also the important domains where India's foreign policy, Indian diplomacy is making an impact, but much more needs to be done you know, in the times to come. Three million years ago, as the next slide shows you, the last time Earth had 400 ppm carbon dioxide Antarctica melted, contributing 13 to 15 meters to global level, sea level rise. Now, this is where we, within the India's foreign policy domain, new partnerships are being built, right? It's not just one ministry, number of ministries, for example, the role that is being played by Ministry of Earth Sciences in Antarctic diplomacy, in, in the Arctic diplomacy, in the deliberations of the Arctic Council, working hand in hand, different ministries coming together and, 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 and speaking on behalf of India and on many respects, speaking on behalf of the global commons. Arctic, next slides, if we can simply run through Arctic. The next is something, you know, which, which uh, again, we don't realize that pandemics, the current pandemic is over, but the future is still very uncertain. This slide, for example, tells you that the permafrost pandemic could the melting ice release a deadly disease? Next, next pandemic may come from melting glaciers, new data shows. So the importance of science in diplomacy, science diplomacy, the importance of science, scientific evidence, knowledge production, politics of knowledge production, ethical implications of knowledge production, all become extremely important. New scientists, could ancient viruses from melting permafrost cause the next pandemic? Australia's climate emergency, next slide tells us. Coastal flooding at 2100, Chittagong, Bangladesh. This is how it is going to look like. Can any country in the world today 
whether it is the United States or India or Australia or Japan. That is the reason that Quad is not only talking about geopolitics, Quad is also talking about various other issues, acknowledging, flagging the point that it's not just 1,000 navies concept or 1,000 ships, sorry, 1,000 ships concept, but it is also 1,000 laboratories, right? Or 10,000 laboratories, natural science laboratories, social science laboratories coming together. The importance of regional diplomacy, regional efforts. No, if we have to save the Sundarbans, and the people of the Sundarbans, the eco, eco, uh, the ecological diversity of Sundarbans, we need India and Bangladesh to cooperate. We need, we need the BIMSTEC framework. We need to rejuvenate SARC, for example. We have to update SARC's climate action plan, which is, which is fairly, uh, I must say, outdated now. So let us just very quickly run through. I will not spend more time. The, the entire package will be with you. And therefore, you will be able to appreciate the importance of the recently concluded UN treaty. This is a slide which tells you that how high seas are facing a cycle of declining ecosystems. Next slide shows you the serious problem of plastics, major source of pollution on the high seas and the health threat to humans and the environment, all habitats. Projections of global scale extreme sea levels and resulting episodic coastal flooding over the 21st century. These are some of the scientific reports. You may like to take a look at these slides later at leisure. This are then you will see a number of slides here, which I have, I have shared with you. I need not spend more time with you, which come from some of these recent publications and the IPCC six assessment report. Please continue with just give them a couple of seconds and you can move on. This is another very important report, which is on the disasters and the mind boggling number of those who are getting displaced by these natural disasters. This is where I made a humble contribution as one of the lead authors of IPCC six assessment report, working group two, chapter 10 on Asia. Here are a few slides that I have put together for you. And the next slide tells you that with every additional amount of global warming, changes are getting larger. So 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees. And if you move, if, if, you, if, you, if, you don't, if we don't act now, then we are heading towards an unbearable future, for sure. Human influence is the main driver. And it clearly tells you that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade will be beyond reach. Now, of course, there is a challenge of collective behavioral change, right? But one thing which I think uh, we are missing out in India's climate change narrative is when there is an emphasis placed by the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, on lifestyle changes. I think we are, we are, we are really missing out a very important point here which is that unless and until, as Gandhiji had said, be the change you want to see, unless and until there is an individual behavioral change, we will not be able to make or go for a collective behavioral change. And unless and until there is a collective behavioral change, we will not have enough incentives at the individual level. So it's, it, things, are, things, are, things are mutually, how should I say, reinforcing um, and we are looking at some very, very important intersections here. So please take a look at these slides. Uh, I don't want to uh, spend more time, except that I will focus on just one slide and read out to uh, uh, in front of you uh, a very important statement made by the IPCC, which is in the next uh, slide, please. And it says that there is high evidence, medium agreement, that increased climate variability and extreme events are already driving migration and medium evidence, medium agreement projecting longer term climate change will increase migration flows across Asia. Despite methodological disagreement on detection and attribution of migration due to climate change, there is medium confidence that higher warming and associated changes in frequency and intensity of slow onset events, such as droughts and sea level rise, and rapid onset events such as cyclones and flooding will increase involuntary displacements in the future, especially under these given scenarios. Please note, in 2019, 
Bangladesh, China, India, and the Philippines each recorded more than 4 million disaster-induced displacements. In Southeast and East Asia, cyclones, floods, and typhoons triggered internal displacement of 9.6 million people in 2019. Almost 30% of total global displacements. So look at the scale that we are talking about. Look at the future that we are heading towards for our children and grandchildren if we do not act now. And the point is that as I'm leaving with you all these slides, uh, I'm also leaving with you a slide which is about my book uh, called Climate Terror, a, a, a critical geopolitics which I've authored with Professor Timothy Doyle. And there in that book, we have argued that it is a global problem. It is a global challenge. We are very much concerned about the future generations, about their well-being. We are concerned about intergenerational equity. Uh, but intragenerational equity is equally important. And that is the reason we appreciate this emphasis of India's G20 presidency on Global South. Decolonization project is not over. <clears throat> yes, it is a global problem. But then we also have to realize that not everybody has equally contributed to climate change. Both the causes and consequences of climate change are not equally shared. They are unequally shared. So that is something which I think we have to, we have to bear in mind. So there are these critical IR perspectives, which I'm leaving you a few slides. We can move on, please. And uh, I'm just leaving uh, on table some of these slides and thoughts for you to consider since it's a workshop, it's, it's not a, a typical uh, formal lecture. You will see that in this contribution to the handbook on climate change disasters, uh, I'm talking about a challenge that we all face. Think tanks, social scientists, natural scientists, IR scholars, because the focus is on foreign policy and that is how to theorize a rather convoluted spatial politics behind the production of geographical knowledge of climate change catering to diverse interests and agendas of various actors and agencies and highly differentiated causes and consequences of climate security, risks and trade-offs in apparently boundless nature of climate change. So my hope is that uh, G20 movement will not stop at the end of India's formal uh, you know, in, in, in India, handing over the presidency to the next country. Uh, I hope that <clears throat> this particular moment, M-O-M-E-N-T, moment, will turn into a moment, including an academic intellectual moment, where we would be encouraged and inspired to talk about the entire vocabulary of mainstream international relations. I'm giving you just one example here. Uh, and that is that if you're talking about security question, then it would be worth asking ourselves, are we not really also talking about the ontological security or insecurities, right? So the key message here is pluralize and politicize knowledge on Anthropocene and its insecurity on the agenda of a South Asian international relations by broadening and deepening the meaning of climate change and the Anthropocene. The complex, social, economic, and political drivers of environmental destruction prompt us to extend beyond singular problem framings and solutions and be attentive to multiple ways of knowing, acting, and being in the world. Security scholars have much to learn from the experiences of communities whose security is jeopardized. Environmental problems are essentially political and raise critical questions about the kinds of societies and environments that we want to live in. These questions need to be subject to open scholarly and public debate. So the question is not what G20 will do to us, right? Not only in this part of the world, global south, but globally, but what we can do to G20 presidency of India and ensure that the narratives, the theorizing that, the theorization that we engage in will also make a difference not only to the discipline of international relations, but to the universe 
of international relations in small letters. So how, how, how will this help us in decolonizing the notion of the Anthropocene, pluralizing it, bring in something which was discussed earlier, but it's also on the agenda, new thinking, ecological economics, for example, you will see a slide where I'm sharing this very fascinating book with you, Anthropocene or Capitalocene, which brings in or which forces us to really uh, rethink the entire notion of, of development. Because we know that the, the concept of development, notion of development has been hijacked by what, what some scholars call a carbo, carbo, carboniferous capitalism. So all these contradictions that we see here, uh, all these fault lines that we see here, the moment that we have seen towards the commodification of nature, which has landed us where we are uh, with, with the pandemic, I sincerely hope that uh, this would be uh, an opportunity for us to, to rethink the concept of development, which I think in many of these dominant narratives on climate diplomacy, climate change, foreign policy, climate politics, uh, do not get the kind of attention uh, that they deserve. Gender dimension, you will see a number of slides. I'm talking about the governing the Anthropocene, and I am then, you will see a few slides. I don't have time, I'm afraid, but you will see that I am, I am put together under a section, an argument saying that the fear of climate change, the fear of Anthropocene is unfolding in a climate of fear. Next slides, please. And you will see that this is an important point, you see, because I think India, India could have chosen, for example, to talk about things like climate apocalypse, you know, Anthropocene uh, catastrophe. But instead, India has chosen a theme which forces us to, to meditate, right? Which forces us to engage with the big questions of the time from a very different perspective. Because on the one hand, what we see is, and one can understand the desperation on the part of we, the scientists who are working on climate change to convey that sense of urgency. Sometimes it sounds like a sense of emergency uh, and perhaps in some cases for, 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 for understandable reasons. But the point is that the language of fear as some of these slides will show you, which I'm leaving with you, clearly suggests that are not working, right? So this is, for example, the next slide will tell you that this is your COVID wake up call. It is hundred seconds to midnight. And it says, governments have also failed to sufficiently address climate change. A pandemic-related economic slowdown temporarily reduced the carbon dioxide emissions that cause global warming. But over the coming decade, fossil fuel use needs to decline if the worst effects of climate change are to be avoided. Instead, fossil fuel development and production are projected to increase. Atmospheric greenhouse concentrations hit a record high in 2020, one of the two warmest years on record. The massive wildfires and catastrophic cyclones of 2020 are illustrations of the major devastation that will only increase if governments do not significantly and quickly amplify their efforts to bring greenhouse gas emissions essentially to zero. So by, by, by relating uh, all these narratives and discourses, all these wake up calls, to our ancient cultural wisdom, what we have done, I think, I believe, is that we have brought these narratives to the local scale, to the scale of the communities. We are talking about the importance of moving away from highly elitist framings of climate knowledge or Anthropocene knowledge to local communities, local people. So it's no surprise that today India's G20 presidency, the kind of visibility that you see throughout the country can also be read in this light, right? Taking these messages to, to towns, to cities, to as many nooks and corners of, of, uh, of India uh, as, as possible. So I think you can take a look at these slides yourselves. Uh, please let us move on. Uh, and uh, you will see that there, there are also, you can very quickly take a look, just a few seconds, right? Billion of us will die. Next, please. Climate borders how securitization of climate change is taking place in many parts of the world. The spectra of humanitarian interventions, climate mobilities, immobilities, how climate change is being framed as a national security discourse. And you will agree with me that, and, and this is also a very interesting slide because it shows you that 
the language of of fear is not is not working climate immobility climate induced migrations the difficulty of of uh, distinguishing non climate attributes from climate change attributions all these underline the importance of a very different kind of mindsets moving away from the classical geopolitical assertions and understandings to a more to a new and nuanced understanding of what causes climate mobilities and what also causes climate immobility because millions of people may not be in a position even to even to migrate if if you take migration as an adaptation strategy so you can you can see we can see how how crowded and challenging the agenda of diplomacy and foreign policy is right now as we as we discuss the impacts and implications of india's g20 presidency and then as the next slide shows you climate is changing but climate is not the only thing that is changing and what about things that are not changing so i have i have i'm leaving behind uh, a slide for you from a report next slide please from world resources report called creating a sustainable uh, food future and it tells you that we would like to see the map of hunger changing for example protein insecurity changing but these maps are not changing to the extent we would want them to change and i have also brought uh, uh, on my, in my slide folder a very fascinating slide from amitav ghosh's book where he talks about these very intriguing intersections where india's foreign policy will now have to work over the years and decades next few decades and he says something which we saw during the pandemic also the 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 displacements and the mobilities and the migrations and he says i quote please next slides it was not next it was not till much later that i began to understand that the difference between the migrants thinking and mine was that for them climate change was not a thing apart a phenomena that could be isolated from other aspects of their experience by a set of numbers or dates rather their experience was formed by sudden and catastrophic intersections of many different factors of which some were undoubtedly new like smartphones and changes in the weather but some other factors were not new at all we rooted ultimately in deeply entrenched structures of exploitation and conflict viewed from this perspective climate change is one but one aspect of a much broader planetary crisis it is not the prime cause of dislocations but neither but rather a cognate phenomenon in this sense climate change mass dislocations pollution environmental degradation political breakdown and the covid-19 pandemic are all cognitive effects of the ever increasing acceleration of the last three decades not only are these crises interlinked they are all deeply rooted in history and they are ultimately driven by the dynamics of global power on court hence the importance of the global south while talking about vasudeva kutumbakam and this slide i will not spend time on this i will leave it uh, i will leave it with you except that you will see that here the argument that we are making is that it's it's not a abrupt unprecedented global manifestation of climate assault on nature in a abstract sense with undifferentiated geographies of responsibility and accountability it is better approached and analyzed as a messy convergence of various strands paradoxes and dilemmas that have emanated from the reckless economic growth undertaken by the minority world of the affluent and influential unquote so my final conclude concluding slide is a call of the pluralized anthropocene from india's g20 presidency i honestly believe that it is very unreasonable unfair for us to believe that the entire pursuit is to be taken by 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 india as a state you know by the ministries concerned i think it it has to it it has to be seen very differently it has to be seen as a zone of contact india's g20 presidency is creating for us a zone of contact zone of conversation and let us as academics as think tanks take up this challenge and contribute to the extent that we can so the call is resonating uh, 
an article which was published in the Millennium, and it says, planet politics must emerge as an alternative thought and process, a politics to nurture worlds for all humans and species co-living in the biosphere. It now demands a new kind of responsibility, binding environmental justice and social justice inextricably together. Global ecological collapse brings new urgency to the claim that we are all in this together, humans, animals, ecologies, biosphere. To survive, we must ask questions that are intimately connected to capitalism and modernity. Now, in one of these recent conversations, I was being asked by, by, by one of the participants that uh, in the audience that you talk about climate change, you talk about politics and ethics of climate knowledge production. Don't you think that the language of climate change remains very scientific and very, very elitist? Just how, how will a common man understand or a common woman understand or a common child understand? And I think uh, this is where I think the, 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 the simplicity of Vasudeva Kutum Kam has to be has to be seen in terms of his profundity. It's, it's such a profound, is such a profound message conveyed in these words, one earth, one family, which even, even a person you know, in, 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 in rural sites can understand. He can, he can, he, we, we can make him think, we can make him realize how important it is to think globally, act locally, and, and, and the other way around. So I think India's G20 presidency is a call for new thinking, is a call for action, is a call for conversations. Everybody has to join in this. Uh, I might, may sound very rhetorical, but as a student, as somebody who is interested in a more global IR, more non-Western international relations, a new foreign policy paradigm, I think it is a moment for us to, 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 to sort of acknowledge that foreign policy uh, can also be a foreign policy of hope. And it's a matter of choices. Another fascinating book by, by Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon. And he says that strategic autonomy is not such a slogan or a desire, but a necessity if we are to transform India. India is and has been anti-status quo power, seeking to revise and reform the international order since Nehru's day. Uh, have we done it enough? Are we there yet? These all are all the questions that must be raised, must be debated, must be answered. But the good news is that, uh, that conversations, multispatial, multifaceted, multidisciplinary have begun under the banner of India's G20 presidency. And that is how I would like to look at it as a scholar of international relations and geopolitics. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was really, really fascinating uh, uh, lecture by you this evening, and uh, it had me completely mesmerized. Thank you so much for uh, these wonderful slides that you made and uh, helped us understand so many uh, new things um, in terms of geopolitics, climate change, and Anthropocene. Thank you so much, indeed. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'll um, just start off. Uh, okay, Harsh. Okay. Uh, I'll just um, uh, hand it over to our participants for their questions. Yeah. And if there is still time, I'll ask you a few questions okay. from my side. Yeah. Um, the first question is by Dikshita. Dikshita, could you please uh, ask your question? I'm not able to see. Uh, 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 no, um, can you hear me? I can hear you, uh, yeah. Okay. okay, fine. I'm in a public place, so it might be difficult to switch on video and everything but what i wanted to know i mean of course the slides okay, uh, are very interesting and uh, of course have a philosophical approach as well but at the end of the day the problems the global problems are such that no one country alone can address them so that's global, why we sorry, have these state, state again, global, global global problems the global problems are such that no one country can single sure. single-handedly address them so we have to come together and that's where the g20 plays a prominent role. So my question is that at this G20 meet, what is being discussed regarding how are we going to collect funds to address the global challenges, especially that of A, climate change, second, livelihoods that have been destroyed across the world after the global pandemic. I mean, at the end of the day, it all requires money. 
So that's the second uh, area where we require funds. And the third, of course, is about the sustainable development goals, which are slightly more longer term and not immediate. So all these three global challenges require money from multilateral sources. And so what is being discussed regarding this at the G20? Or what's the approach? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, thank you very much. It's a very important question, but I think, um, I think the challenge that we all face uh, in, in times of uncertainty is not only getting uh, sometimes our answers right, but uh, I think sometimes also I find it very difficult myself to uh, getting my questions right uh, because you see we know that uh, climate change uh, is a very complex uh, phenomena. It has mitigation aspects, it has adaptation aspects. And it also has something called loss and damage, right? Uh, and the fact of the matter is that, as I mentioned, not everybody is equally responsible, not everybody is equally affected, which means that you need you need resources, uh, you need knowledge, knowledge defined as the capacity to act. You need money, you need funds. Uh, from where will they come? Uh, when, when we'll continue to, uh, to, to sort of look into all possibilities, whether, $100 billion fund will ever be there, or uh, we will have philanthropic contributions, we will have civil society contributing, whether their countries will impose carbon, carbon, uh, or whether this, this carbon trading will work, which, which, which uh, I think I'm very critical of it. Uh, Market-based solutions will play a role, but they will also have, have their own limits. So we will run risks of all kinds. So that is one way of of looking at it and, and getting very pessimistic about it and say, well, we have already arrived at a doomsday. That's one way of looking at it because these are huge questions. No, nobody will be able to give you know, simple and straightforward answers. But if we, if we also ask ourselves, uh, if we ask questions from a different perspective in the sense that those parts of the globe where there are still possibilities of interventions, very important interventions, like Antarctica, for example, 5.5 million square miles space surrounded by the Southern Ocean. Already there is a crisis in the Southern Ocean, no doubt about it. But can, can we do something? We, by means states, civil societies, NGOs, academic institutions, everyone, all stakes and stakeholders, can they anticipate, can there be an anticipatory proactive approach? We talk about formal governance, can we also think in terms of informal governance? So I think this is the best answer I can give to you a very important question, but very difficult question that there is, there are good reasons to believe that we are probably uh, leaving behind this idea or this ideal of 1.5 degrees. We are probably going much beyond, much above that. But then we also have to remember that numbers also have to be contextualized, right? which means that we will have to see as to how different intersections are working. For example, in our country, in India, we, we just can't, we can't afford to define climate change only as global warming, right? We have to broaden and deepen the meaning of, of climate change, which means that intersections of, of, of global warming, uh, uh, economic inequalities, social hierarchies, caste-based hierarchies, gender biases, racial discriminations, all these intersections will have to be addressed. So my point is that again, governments will play an important role, no doubt. Rich countries particularly have to play a very important role. Maybe they will contribute also out of their own selfish interests. Because don't, don't forget that the, one of the geopolitics of the geoeconomics of climate change is that the model of development that was being sold by the global north the minority world the majority world during 1950s and 60s is now has become you know the major the, the major uh, sort of quote unquote cause of global warming and it's not a finite space it's not a sorry infinite space it's a finite space so who has the right to develop who has the right to pollute all these questions will continue to generate geopolitical and ethical controversies so i know i have given a very convoluted long answer to your question but I think your question provokes us to think about all these. So thank you for your question. 
no, uh, thank, thank you for your answers, uh, Prof. Um, I, I was also thinking on the lines of a special vehicle to address some of these issues. Uh, I have I have missed your voice. A special, uh, so special, special vehicle, purpose special vehicle, purpose vehicle. Can, can special. Can to special work purpose vehicle, which will be run on uh, as a business entity, which will stay focused on addressing the G20 mandate. I'm not aware of if there is any such vehicle, but uh, that could be a consensus point. Could be. Um, I, 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 I find it very difficult okay. at this stage to, um, to give any definitive uh, answer about that, but I think there is there is this growing sense of urgency, no doubt about it. Uh, but then we also have to remember that there are also these uh, hugely important but complex issues like technology transfers, uh, different uh, you know the kind of investments that you need for climate science. Uh, as I said, the politics of climate knowledge production. So we are looking at some very, very difficult, uh, difficult baskets of issues, right? These are not, these are not simple. South-South cooperation will very become very important, I think. Uh, we will have to sort of sometimes redirect multilateralism. To give you just one example of how things are unfolding, uh, Iora, I showed that, that um, you know, on, on the very first title uh, slide, Indian Ocean Rim Association. And I was listening to Professor Bhattacharji earlier, and uh, she talked about small scale, right? Small scale industries and small scale. Now, it is important to remember, uh, to, to note that in the last meeting of IORA in Dhaka, Bangladesh is currently the chair. After a long time, climate change was placed as a cross-cutting issue in Dhaka for the IORA members, member states and, and, and dialogue partners. There was a debate, the idea was very well received, but there was also this thinking that we have to focus on clearly marked uh, issue areas. And one possibility can be that we focus on small scale, right? So we, for example, we, have, we also talk about the 10 million small scale fishermen who are in the Bay of Bengal in the large marine ecosystem. So which means that you will have to work at regional level, you will have to work at sub-regional levels, and one cannot really hope that funding will come from one single source. Public-private partnerships will also become very important. Yeah. No, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for an engaging uh, dialogue. I mean, this is an ongoing conversation and there are no answers at this stage. So. Very Thank difficult you. to find. But as I said, I think our main challenge at the moment is getting our questions right, which, which I am also struggling with in my own ways that because we are so much used to asking questions from our own disparate location. For example, when we talk about foreign policy, we believe, we assume as if there is something, a black box model called foreign policy. And, and we work within those conventional traditional understandings of what foreign is, what policy is, what, you know, and I think that that needs to change now. The sooner, the better. Thank you so much, sir, for your elaborate response. We have with us Karishma. Karishma, please unmute and ask your question. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for your entire session. Uh, climate change and security in South Asia is an area that I am also uh, very fascinated with. And therefore, your session was so relevant for me. And I really appreciate you mentioning it's important for us to get our questions right. I hope that I continue to have an opportunity to engage with you further on this topic as we go along, maybe through email, if that could be shared as well. Sure. Uh, my question is that your uh, uh, session actually mentioned uh, the importance of moving away from territorial traps and tropes and bringing about a change in border thinking. 
uh, your address also emphasized the importance of academic diplomacy, local communities, and how India is using this platform as becoming the voice of the global South. In that context, what do you think is the potential uh, of this as far as our immediate neighborhood or our immediate neighbor Pakistan is concerned? Uh, with respect to India and Pakistan, is there something that is already taking place in terms of academic diplomacy, local communities, like you mentioned in the context of Iora, with Bangladesh being the chair and India and Bangladesh engaging on these issues? Is there something happening on the other side as well, uh, as far as the borders are concerned? Please share for us. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you see, I come from a location, I come from an institution, which is South Asian University. Um, and as you know that South South Asian University, we have now moved to our beautiful campus. In fact, I'm 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 uh, speaking here. I'm sitting here in my office at Medan Gadi. It's, it's a hundred acre beautiful campus. Uh, and uh, this is this is another uh, another example of India's commitment to South Asian regionalism. And we know the kind of geopolitical challenges that we face that we continue to face with our neighborhood uh, on that side. Having said that, I don't think India's diplomacy and India's foreign policy has looked at only one Pakistan, which means that has only looked at Pakistan as a state. Uh, but we also believe that there is something called people in Pakistan, there's something called civil society in Pakistan. And I think India has remained open and willing to engage uh, with, with all possible sites, S-I-T-E-S uh, in Pakistan so that we can create a new regional consciousness, we can, we can create a new regionalism. And, and you know, sometimes we forget, I mentioned it in very, very uh, sort of passing that, sometimes we forget uh, that uh, no doubt we live in post-colonial South Asia, we live in post-partition South Asia, that makes, it, makes things more complicated. But we also are joined by the hip, as I said, ecologically speaking, because South Asia is an ecological, eco-geographical subcontinent, what is also called the Indian subcontinent, right? If you look at our rivers, uh, for example, and you know that despite all the troubles that we have with our neighbor Pakistan, uh, we have uh, remained committed to areas of cooperation like the Indus Water Treaty which again at some stage will require uh, uh, you know, a relook in the sense that climate change related challenges also will have to be factored into many of these bilateral, bilateral agreements. Disasters know no boundaries, no borders. So it is a challenge, it is a challenge. And I really hope that academic engage engagement, academic intellectual conversations on both the sides will continue uh, and uh, and one can really hope for a better future for the for the entire subcontinent as a whole uh, south asian university as as you all know has kept a motto called knowledge without borders so we are constantly reminding ourselves day in and day out the kind of uh, mission that we have which is it is not simply a university it is also a mission, it is also a vision and a pursuit. So there are challenges, but then I also, I always remain hopeful because I think hope is, is something we must not abandon. We should always remember that there was a time when France and Germany were enemies. And today they can't even think of going to war with each other. May not be in my lifetime, but I really hope that uh, as you get into your 30s and 40s and 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 you you move forward you will be able to see a new south asia you know which which will be driven by a new politics new geopolitics new diplomacy utopias of today are the realisms of tomorrow not in the realist sense of the power struggles but i think let us not let us not give up thinking philosophically <laughs> let us let us not uh, let us not give up uh, hope on humanism um, uh, because that is that is very very important i know i have not completely answered your question but but i give you the example of south asian university and uh, we remain hopeful 
uh, as a part of the vision out of which Sao has come that in times to come, we will see more and more students and scholars mm -hmm. from all around South Asia. Also from all these where we don't have many students right now. In fact, we do have none. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 we are working for it. And uh, this itself will be a great sight to watch the South Asian University. Karishma, thank, thank that's, you. All I, that's all I could do. <laughs> thank you. Sir. I'd only say amen to that with the hope. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, hope to end our uh, session today. And thank it has been really amazing listening to you with so many thoughts pondering. And definitely this is a um, uh, topic which has to be um, which has to be discussed at all points and because this is the future which we have to live with the Anthropocene uh, era. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to all the attendees uh, this evening and I would just request Aswash to formally conclude the session. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so with this, we come to the end of this three-day immersive online certificate training course on India's G20 presidency and contours of Indian foreign policy. I, Aswash Mahanta, would formally like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, CIRSS IMPRI. We are grateful to all our experts who have joined us in these three days, including Ambassador Shashank, Captain Alok Bansal, Ms. Nandita Barwa, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, Professor Sanjay Shaturvedi, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, Mr. Don McLean Gill, Dr. Parama Sinha Palit, and Professor Annapurna Nautial. I would also like to thank our convener, Dr. Simi Mehta, for moderating these sessions. We thank all of our participants for joining us, asking important questions, and actively participating in these deliberations. I would like to inform all the participants that as an institute's policy, we do not really share the experts' PowerPoint presentations. However, those who need a copy of it can write and get in touch with the experts and request the same, citing reference to this course. We will share the feedback form via email. We request you all to kindly fill it, following which we will be sharing the certificate of completion in a couple of days. We have shared the recorded video of the training programs in your email for your kind perusal in case you have missed the live sessions. Now, I would like to thank the organizing team at IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, CIRSS, for conducting this entire session in such a smooth manner. We are grateful if you're watching us later on YouTube, listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join us in the future for our IMPRI web policy talks and web policy networks. With this, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everyone.